Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hey Carl, it is so good to see you today, uh, although admittedly across video, but uh, it's like a little blast from the past from, I don't know, 20 years ago, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. We uh, had a good group of friends back uh, back in the old days at at, at Stanford, and I haven't uh, kept in touch with them as much as I'd hoped. But it's great to see you. It really brings back a lot of memories. You look great, unchanged. Well, uh, yeah, it's funny. You you don't look a bit different. Um, it it is funny when I think back to to that class of ours in med school, and I really feel like the overwhelming underachiever of our class. Um, and I, I remember our first day of our surgical rotation, uh, you, me and Josh Rabinowitz in that sitting in that room, waiting for us to be assigned to which service we would go to. Of course, you and Josh have gone on to do unbelievable things. Um, I've sort of muddled along, but, um, ah, now you're the star. And plus, I remember you, even though it was the start of our surgery rotation, you already knew how to do everything, which I was impressed by. You, you knew all the knots and, and I was like, wait, this is the first day of the rotation. How do you do that? <laughs> well, let's pick it up back there. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, you were in the MD PhD program, so we didn't start at the same time. We just finished at the same time. You had come in earlier. Um, but I think the reason I knew you even on our first day of surgery was because you had done your PhD in the same lab as two other friends of mine, Alex Ravenis and Jason Pyle. Um, and I mean, all kidding aside, I think that, you know, look, all the kids that went to med school were pretty bright, but I think the MD PhD students were sort of in a class of their own. Um, and I suspect it was even harder to get into that program than it was just the straight MD program. So uh, thinking back to your time as an undergrad, but what, what did you major in again in, in undergrad? I, uh, I, I did biochemical sciences, they called it at, at Harvard instead of biochemistry. They had to do everything different and, and they didn't call it a, a major either. It was a concentration. So I, I concentrated in biochemical sciences. So there you go. But uh, I had a lot of other interests. All my friends were physicists, uh, theoretical physicists, uh, in fact. Uh, and so I, I was exposed to some uh, some pretty uh, unusual stuff for a biochemist. And were they allowed to call it theoretical physics at Harvard? They were. <laughs> okay, well, that's that's good. I just I just want to. <laughs> good question. Yeah. Yes, they, they, they were allowed to, to name it. That, good, yes. good. So at what point during your biological science concentration did you know you wanted to go into medicine? Uh, it was pretty early because I, I was interested in the brain early on and I, I wanted to understand the brain at the level of cells and but I was also interested in the most high level aspects of brain function and so I thought I needed uh, to talk to human beings I needed uh, some some access to the to the human brain uh, I found that interesting because I was interested in emotion and the ability to express uh, feelings through words and and I, I had this I was torn I liked writing and literature and and uh, and the use of words and I liked cells and biology and I wanted to somehow fuse them, and it seemed that that medical school was the the way to go because I could I could work with the human brain. And um, obviously, you could have just gone to medical school, but you you also selected into this very very advanced program that was incredibly selective, the MST program, the medical science training program. Um, and so that tells me at the outset that you also knew you wanted to do research beyond you know quote unquote just clinical medicine. Yes. Yeah, that's right, and and that was the. That was the, you know, the, the nice thing about the MSTP is it lets you delay a, making a commitment, you know, so you, you keep both threads alive. And then uh, there, there's a beautiful synergy that can happen too, and certainly happened with me that, that you realize, oh wait, I don't have to make this decision and actually is good to keep both threads alive in, in, in my work and in my life. And that, that's, what, that's what happened. But it's a it's a pretty special thing we have in, in the United States. Uh, there are efforts in, along these lines in, in Europe and, and, and other countries, but it's not nearly as uh, institutionalized as, as it is here. It's a really a special thing. Well, it, it really is. And I, again, I, I keep re saying this, but I, I feel like there were maybe, what, six or eight MSTPs per class. Um, and I always felt like you guys had the most pressure on you, right? There was this expectation from both the clinical side that you would go on to be great doctors, but then you were also, especially at places like Stanford, where you had the opportunity to do your PhDs with 
Nobel laureates, would be Nobel laureates, you know, exceptional scientists that you would also basically be leading the charge scientifically. And, you know, for what it's worth, all of my friends in the MSTP program, I think you're the only one that ended up doing clinical training as well. I think most of them didn't end up doing residencies. They either went purely into academic research tracks or actually went into industry. Um, but before we get mm -hmm. into the fact that you also did clinical training, let's talk a little bit about that transition. <clears throat> you came into medical school pretty hell bent on neurosurgery, yeah? That was the goal because you know, again, how do you how do you get access to the to the human brain and who among the different clinical specialties has that uh, access? Who can who can uh, would most directly interact, study? And it seemed to me the neurosurgeons had it all. Uh, and if one were to build a, an interface with the brain, uh, if one wanted to both communicate with a person as they were expressing feelings and emotions and to understand at the level of cells what was going on, who could do that but, but a neurosurgeon was my, was my reasoning. And you know, uh, and I, the neurosurgeons, the, my, the, my colleagues and friends, they're amazing people, you know, brilliant, and, and I, I saw no reason not to, to pursue that, and so that was, the first rotation that I, I selected in the in those uh, second two years of medical school, even before surgery, I did neurosurgery, and so which was kind of interesting, just just coming in there with uh, with no general surgical training as well. That's how how certain I was. Yeah, it's funny. Um, <laughs> well, I, I had a similar experience. Whereas the thing I absolutely positively thought I was going to do, I picked as my first rotation. Uh, in my case, I had less of a pleasant experience than you. I think you had a pleasant experience on neurosurgery. It wasn't that in any way you didn't like it, but what was your first? Well, I, I planned to do pediatric oncology. So I, I went out mm. of the gates with two months of pediatrics, um, which, which actually I didn't enjoy, um, largely cause I just didn't feel like I didn't fit in. I think so much of your medical school experience in terms of your clinical rotations is a function of how well do you fit in with the residents of that specialty and yep. I didn't feel like I fit in with the pediatricians. They didn't laugh at my jokes. They thought I was probably a little too obnoxious. Um, I probably spent yeah. too much time imitating Dr. Evil and fat bastard pretending to eat the babies, but it just, the whole thing just didn't go well. It was a disaster. And then my next rotation was general surgery where we connected. Uh, and even though I had no desire whatsoever to go into surgery, that became a, a kind of overnight love and, and away we go. But so, so you're doing your neurosurgery rotation, which again, yes, highly unusual that you would do that so early in your training. That's usually something one does in the fourth year, not the third year. Um, and I mean, I'll say this, Carl, when I did general surgery at Hopkins, I did one month of neurosurgery as a rotation having never been interested in neurosurgery. So sort of saying, well, fine, I'll do this. I, I didn't have a choice. I had to do this month of neurosurgery. And I fell in love with it. I couldn't, I, and in fact, I spoke to the program director at Hopkins and said, would it be ridiculous for me to try to transfer into neurosurgery? Um, that's how much I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And it turned out that he said, I can absolutely get you in, but it won't be at Hopkins. Hopkins is the most competitive neurosurgery program in the country. We only take three people. It's already full. You're not going to get in here, but I can get you to another program. And I, I actually mm -hmm. contemplated it for about a month. So I can see the appeal of it. There was something about cutting open the dura and operating on the brain. And um, it's a surprisingly simple organ in that sense, like at, at the gross level, it's surprisingly simple. Obviously, much of what we're going to talk about today, Carl, is not at the gross level where it's anything but simple. But um, what was your experience like? I mean, it was uh, yeah. At, at the one at one level, it is an organ, and and it's it would be unfair to say that all that neurosurgeons get to do is think about it as an organ. They they do have to think about that the blood supply and the, and and the, whether the cells are receiving enough oxygen and 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 uh, and glucose and. They have to think about it in the in the context of the, the physicality of it, uh, perhaps more than the, the the mentation aspect of it. And so, but they 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 do get to think about high level concepts in that rotation in that month. There was a, a patient who had a little bit of a thalamic uh, infarct as a result of the the surgery and a little bit of uh, loss of, of tissue in the thalamus, and the patient had a neglect syndrome. 
uh, which I spent a lot of time working with the patient afterward, characterizing exactly how this worked. Uh, you know, I asked the patient to draw a clock, and the patient drew, you know, just half of a clock, and it was a, a, an amazing, you know, classical thing, but amazing to see with your own eyes as you're talking to mm. another person, and the, the, the person said, oh, the, the clock looks fine, it's a, but it was a half a clock, and, and I, that certainly didn't diminish my interest in neurosurgery at all. It was, you know, this was at, at, at the one level, you know, there were problems which nearly clearly needed to be better, you know, aspects of, of neurosurgery, as with every clinical specialty, needed to improve, needed to reduce, uh, you know, consequences um, like that. And yet at the same time, it was incredibly interesting as well. I loved the operating room. I, I loved the suturing, although I wasn't as good as, as you, I think. And I, I, uh, uh, but I was good enough, uh, and it was particularly because it was so early. Uh, I think the the, the promise was there; it, it would have worked out. And th- it was; it still had a magic about it. You know, when you when the dura is exposed, it's a it's yes, it's it's an organ, but it's a there's a spirituality to that to to know that that you're actually looking at the the storehouse of a human being's, you know thoughts and feelings and and everything about them all all encapsulated in this collection of cells it's it's quite a, an amazing thing and so I, I had no negativity at all I did note that neurosurgeons they they didn't get a lot of free time uh, there was not a lot of you know f- philosophizing uh, and I noticed you know it's a seven year progression uh, and I talked to all the neurosurgery residents and I noted a steady decline and willingness to philosophize uh, as their progression through the re- residency uh, uh, continued. You could almost plot that, you know, linearly on a, on a graph. And, <laughs> and uh, with all, you know, due credit to them, it's, it's the nature of the system they're in. That they don't necessarily have all the time they would like to, to think deeply, um, although they certainly are very bright and thoughtful and certainly could. And so I did note that. I noted that, you know, here are, here are people who maybe um, don't have the freedom uh, to do everything I would like. And, and that was in the back of my mind. Yeah. I think back to the three people in my class. So at the entering class at Hopkins, the three of them were neurosurgery assigned. So they did the internship with us, but then they went off and I mean, boy, they were, they were three ridiculously smart guys. Yeah. And, and you would think, well, they're in neurosurgery. So how interested are they going to be in their year of general surgery? But they were every bit the exceptional interns that e- that the categoricals were, the ones who were gonna go into general surgery. But one of the experiences that jumps out at me from my month of general surgery at, in, in my internship was a, an awake procedure we did on a patient. So under local anesthetic, the brain was opened and the patient while wide awake was being probed a, in an effort to determine certain symptoms and to see what part of the brain could be lesioned in order to ameliorate these symptoms. And I think for anybody to see that in real life with their own eyes even once is, it's it's really hard to believe what you're watching, right? First of all, the brain is not the same sensory organ. The fact that you can be awake while a surgeon is probing into your brain and firing an electrical impulse into one area or another to see how it changes this part of your visual field or this part of your, I mean, that was, that was something that, that was a magic that I, I don't think I could describe otherwise. Yeah. And, and that, I felt that very, very strongly. And so there was, it was all systems go after that. They, you know, surprisingly <laughs> the neurosurgeons at Stanford liked me. Okay. After that too, I got very positive feedback uh, from them and, and, and uh, they said, Hey, you know, come back and do a, a sub I sub internship, and we'd we'd love to 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 get you uh, down this path. Um, so, which which was a you know that that was a that was a, a green light, and and I was I was happy with that. It was it was where I was uh, headed. Um, of course, things changed after that. Yeah. So the best laid plans. Um, mm-hmm. There was another mandatory. There's a set of mandatory rotations we have to do. Neurosurgery not being one of them, but pediatrics, general surgery, internal medicine being the OBGYN. And one of them is psychiatry. Kind of this yes. afterthought for, you know, <laughs> the medical student, right? Very few people yeah. want to go into psychiatry. And yet, amazingly, two of the smartest people in my med school class, you and Paul Conti, end up picking this field ultimately. Just, 
amazing, right? So tell me about your, how, how did you go into your psychiatry rotation? Were you looking forward to this? Or did you view it the way many of us did, which was just get me through it? I had a get me through it, uh, you know, attitude coming in. Um, and again, no, no disrespect to, to psychiatry, of course. Uh, you know, it's a, they have a hard challenge. Still, we have this challenge that there's not a, uh, a measurable, really. You know, we have, we have effectively you know, questions we ask patients. It's all with, with words is, is how we, we work. And, and, no, and no biomarker. No biomarker still. Yeah. I mean, there's efforts along those lines looking at EEG, you know, ratios of, of this to that. And, and there's progress being made. But still, clinically, you can't make diagnoses uh, based on measuring something about the brain in psychiatry. You can, you can notice that there's something else going on, uh, a neurological or a medical problem, but you, you can't uh, de define someone's psychiatric state with, with a, some biomarker. And that still, amazingly to this day, still true. Yeah. So what, tell me about your psych rotation. Cause I remember we kind of had choices. I did an entirely outpatient month, um, which I ended up finding quite enjoyable. That's the irony of these things. You kind of, I did it as one of my last rotations prior to graduation, which meant there was no chance, even if I'd liked it, I, it was too late for me to make that choice. I had already matched, I think in general surgery. Um, but it was an outpatient month. So relatively low acuity. Um, but but interesting, nevertheless. What what was your month like? So my mine was the uh, opposite of that. It was, and this was probably a fortunate thing for me. It was in the locked unit at the uh, VA at the Veterans mm. Administration Hospital, and this was a uh, a unit where patients uh, uh, can't leave, uh, and this is due to you know being a danger to themselves or a danger to others or having uh, a grave disability. Uh, and this, uh, uh, you know, these patients were uh, severely ill, uh, and I, I walked into that. Uh, you know, I, I'd had typical experiences. Uh, everybody, you know, has friends or family who've had, you know, depression or anxiety. I, I'd, I'd had, uh, I'd seen substance abuse and, and intoxicated states and, and dementia, and, and, and I had a, a fairly, you know, I thought, decently broad understanding of, of what can go wrong on the on the psychiatric side. But uh, I can tell you nothing, and you, you know this by now, but, but uh, I, can, I can tell your, your viewers uh, and listeners, there is nothing like what you can see uh, when you walk into the, the locked ward of a, of a psychiatric hospital. There's a, there's the, uh, there's a, a sort of a, a purity uh, not in a good way, but there's a, a, a the, because there's not confounding issues like intoxication and so on. There's a there's a, a a consistency and a purity to the disorders. And so, if you have someone with acute schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, other things that might confound what's going on have been removed. And there's this very strong acute. Uh, um, uh, straightforward expression of the symptoms that's just uh, mind-boggling to see if you haven't experienced it before and and that's that was was my experience and it completely changed my course there was a even on the you know my very first day there was a a, a patient with schizoaffective disorder which is a very severe combination of mood and psychotic symptoms that are all mixed up together and this patient uh, accosted me in the in the locked unit, started screaming at me, and, and but it was it was not uh, necessarily a, sort of a street encounter that you might have in a in a city. It was more uh, it was more uh, direct and personal and uh, evocative of something going on in the in the mind of the patient that was clearly a source of immense suffering, uh, of great disability, and yet at the same time it was. It was uh, tantalizing because this was a, a human being who was physically intact, but whose reality was so completely different from mine. We were two people with intact bodies and 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 brains who were uh, you know next to each other, and we inhabited completely different realities. And to experience that was a utterly uh, transformative moment. And and both seeing the the suffering and realizing I have no idea what's going on here, but it's incredibly interesting too. How is this possible? How could this be happening to a, a human being? And, and without that direct exposure, 
uh, I don't know what would have happened, but having had it, it, it changed my course. Which is interesting. I mean, uh, many people when confronted with that would be quite frightened. Um, especially when you realize the limitations of the tools that you have, right? So let, let's, let's consider a, a, another analogy, which is, you know, a patient that comes in with a gunshot wound to the chest, that's an incredibly frightening experience. There's literally, you know, a, a sucking chest wound, blood could be splaying around the room, vital signs are crashing, the person's on the verge of death. But that can be exciting in a way because we actually have the tools to do something, right? It might be completely draconian. We might be doing a thoracotomy in the ER, cross clamping the aorta, but you run that patient to the OR and you know how to fix them. You're experiencing something that I would argue is much more frightening, but compounded by the fact that what do you do? I mean, you, you could temporarily give that person Haldol and, and sort of snow them, but that's not curing them. So was it, which of, was it more the we don't have the tools here. This is an unbelievable opportunity to learn or, or, or you know, how, how did that experience, which I think for many people could have been off-putting, do the exact opposite in you? I mean, I had, uh, it's, it's a great question because I, I, and I would completely understand that the normal uh, or typical reaction would be sort of an aversive thing. You know, how this is, this is not something I want to spend my life uh, doing in this in this setting, um, but I had a I had a different reaction which surprised me, uh, and it was partly it was it was really there were two sides to it. One was exactly what you're saying. Uh, it, the level of mystery here was uh, actually for me it was a, a positive rather than an aversive thing. And maybe this was partly the my scientific training. You know, at that point I'd completed my my PhD and and. And I'd spent years trying to figure things out. Uh, and we all want to figure things out. That's a natural human impulse. Not everybody uh, necessarily spends years and years and years trying to figure out the same thing. And that's, that's the kind of uh, training we get in, 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 in the PhD program. And I saw that and I was like, okay, got to figure this out. This is, this is clearly uh, a mystery that uh, is something that it's a burden that humanity shares. It's a terrible burden that this human being is suffering. But what's the solution? We've got to figure it out. We've got to understand this. And and it's a, a mystery that strikes to the heart of, of what had always intrigued me, which is what is what is an emotion physically? What is a, a feeling physically? How does the collection of cells in our brains, and that's what it is, it's a collection of cells. How, how is it possible that that creates a feeling and emotion, and I realized at that moment, this is <laughs> this is actually, you know, why I came to medical school. This and it all made sense in in one moment that, that hadn't before. And and then you know, of course, as a as a as a physician, as you well know, we our instinct is to help, is to heal, and and we want to do that. But as as you say, if we don't have the tools, what what can we do? It's it's a problem. Uh, and I wasn't frustrated with the inability to do anything. And I would understand that reaction too. And the fact is we, we could do a little bit though. Uh, so it wasn't quite nothing. Uh, and there are medications back then and still that help somewhat. They don't come with understanding. They don't help us explain to the patient or the family or to ourselves what's really going on, but they do help a little bit. And so I was, I knew that I could do something, not much, but a little bit. And as time went on, hopefully, and as the science progressed, maybe we could do more. And so that, it, it, it fit together in a, in a moment. And I didn't have another thought uh, uh, for neurosurgery after that, although it was, it was a hard uh, process, uh, you know, to, reshape what my trajectory was going to be. I had one set of plans. My friends and family had a set of expectations. I can tell you, I think my my father was pretty disappointed when I told him on the phone that I was going to do psychiatry. I could hear it in his voice. It was it was almost, uh, yeah, it was a quite a 
and and you know again he he came around in the end too and and I think he's he, he's happy uh, now but uh, at the time I could I could sense that this was not what he'd he'd hoped for me um, so yeah it was it was an adjustment it was a, a remapping uh, but it was a, a very compelling experience that that the the process of medical training uh, and the required psychiatry rotation made possible. So Carl, you you now make this decision to completely veer into this nearly orthogonal track. I mean, psychiatry and neurosurgery, of course, have one thing in common, which is the the organ of interest is the brain. But at that point, they basically you know differ. Um, how did you decide you were going to both pursue the clinical training, the residency for psychiatry, but also do whatever was necessary to make sure that you could ultimately be running a lab? Because I, I think throughout this period, you never lost sight, unless I'm misremembering, um, of the desire to be a physician scientist and not just a physician. So, you know, residency, especially 20 years ago when we did our residencies, they didn't have 80 hour work week requirements and things like that. So residencies were quite demanding. Mm -hmm. Was it a little hard for you to say, Hey, I'm going to actually have to put my research on hold for a little while. It was, it was hard. And this is, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of, uh, challenges that, that people in this realm face because things move so quickly, uh, in the research realm that if you step aside for even a year, forget about four years, uh, you know, the world you re-enter is, is so different and it's very hard to catch up. And this is, you know, that's to some extent an old problem because that's been faced by everybody who planned to do a residency. Uh, but it's, a, it's not negligible because it's an old problem. It's that issue exactly that ends up uh, driving people to make this hard choice that you mentioned earlier and saying, you know, in the end, I'm going to have to do one or the other. If I do the residency, I'll, I'll, I'll be a, I'll be a doctor. I'll be a, a good doctor, maybe a great doctor. I'll be, I'll be informed by all my scientific training. Maybe I'll read papers better. Maybe I'll be more, you know, amenable to new ideas, new treatments as a result of that. But ultimately I'll be a, a, a physician or on the other side, saying, you know, I'm not going to do the residency. I'm not going to drop off this, this fast moving train. I'm at this moment, I've just finished my PhD. I'm a world expert in this. I can do things that, that nobody else can do. Why lose that momentum? Why not speed up, add the next tool in the tool belt, launch yourself and make great discoveries. And that is very, very tempting. I had uh, you know, very clear opportunities to do that. And so that's the hard choice that, that the, the MD PhD faces at that moment. Um, now efforts are made to, to ameliorate that. So residencies, you know, again, this was, this was the, the, the time still where the residencies, uh, were extremely difficult. Uh, and, and I had some, for me, this was compounded by some personal challenges. I was uh, effectively a single dad at the time. And so I had to also think about, this this other factor uh, very important. Um, you know, I, now I've got I've got to think about residency. I've got to think about lab. I've got to think about family, and and it was very very uh, challenging. Uh, and yet there are these research track residencies, uh, and and th and they they help a little bit. So there are uh, and and Stanford and other uh, pr you know uh, programs both in psychiatry and in other specialties they have efforts to, to help people keep their, their scientific, uh, you know, mind alive during residency. And it's, it's not great, but it's a little bit, a uh, little bit of protected time here and there, never quite enough to get momentum, but at least to, to keep a foot in the lab and, and, and try to stay connected. And so I did that. It was a research track, psychiatry residency. And I, I, I stayed at Stanford and a big factor in that was that, uh, literally at the same time, and I was very fortunate in this uh, regard, uh, a, uh, a guy named uh, Rob Malenka, who was a psychiatrist and a, and a great neuroscientist, was at that moment uh, coming from UCSF to Stanford. Uh, he had come and was setting up his lab uh, at, at Stanford. And I knew here's somebody, a psychiatrist, but also a neuroscientist. He'll understand, you know, what's going on in my residency that I'm 
you know, I'm taking call, I'm, I'm up all night. Uh, he'll know, he'll understand why I'm never in the lab during expected hours, why I'm never at lab meeting. And, and, and that made it work out. And I worked nights and weekends. Um, I, I maybe came to one of his lab meetings over, over four years and I effectively did a combined uh, postdoctoral fellowship and psychiatry residency at the same time at Stanford. Some funny stories, I, you know, I, I, because Stanford's very compact, as you know, I could literally take call from, you know, from the lab. Uh, I'd be patch clamping, I'd be at, at the rig, you know, listening in, me making measurements on currents flowing across a single cell, and I'd get paged, go walk over to the ER, admit a patient, come back, you know, patch clamp the next cell, and it was a pretty special moment uh, uh, when that happened. It, it felt like the different parts of my life were, they, they could work together, they could be compatible. And that, with all, you know, so many people have such a hard time understandably making that work, making the pieces fit together. And I, I feel fortunate that uh, I, I was able to make that work. Now, what year was your son born? 98? Uh, he, he was actually born in 96. So he is. So you're four, uh, he, he is five years old, basically, when you're in yes. the midst of this. Yeah, that's right. So how, how did you. How did you manage that? You know, it was these. This is actually uh, something that that I I touch on. Uh, I don't know we may talk about this. Uh, the the book mm -hmm. I wrote, projections later, but it was a it turned out to be a theme early in my in my life. How my experiences with my son, how they related to all the the stressors and the patient experiences that I was having, and in a way psychologically although it was it's difficult to make everything work uh, uh practically um it also uh it, it helped me uh a little bit to have a uh a, a something that mattered more than anything else in the lab or in the in the clinic there was something that uh sort of uh was on a different scale and it helped me not get to uh, stressed about things happening in the lab or the clinic, uh, and and uh, that that's a, a common feeling in, in people with kids. For me, it was it was extremely important at that at that time. Um, you know, and it was a there were patchwork solutions of of, of, of childcare and so on that, that made things work. But it was ultimately, I think, it was helpful for me in, in getting through those those times. And and by the way, he is now an MSTP student at Baylor. So he's doing his MD, PhD uh, in Texas, and he's now second year. He's a cool kid. He's, he's good at guitar, much better than I am. And uh, he likes computer science. <laughs> yeah, he's got some big shoes to fill, but I, and I'm positive that none of that pressure comes from you. So, um, no. so I remember when you were finishing your residency, um, I just remember because of our common friends, like how kind of exciting it was when you were now setting up your own lab. So we're talking about what, 05, 06 ish? Yeah, the lab started to get set up in 04. Okay. Uh, and then it really hit full steam, yeah, between 06 and 09. But 04 was when we were setting it up. So as you're embarking on this, what is it that you experienced during that? that transformation of your, your clinical training, your residency, how did that shape the problems you were interested in solving? Well, I, you know, having just completed my psychiatry residency, I had seen, I, I had a pretty deep understanding of where things were clinically. Uh, I knew what, not just the medications we had, but also the brain stimulation treatments, the interventions that we had available at the time. I did, uh, you know, I did electroconvulsive therapy, which uh, is, you know, it's a, it's very effective for treatment-resistant depression. Uh, it's the treatment of choice uh, for many people. It's incredibly effective. It's stunning to see. It's, it has some problems. Uh, you don't want to give it too much, and there, there can be side effects, but it's incredibly effective. What's the durability of it? Uh, it depends. Uh, some patients need uh, what we call, you know, uh, uh, maintenance uh, electroconvulsive therapy. So after three months or so, uh, the effect will be diminished, and, and they'll they'll uh, uh, require uh, to stay alive effectively. Patients who are, for example, just acutely suicidal, uh, and they, they'll need every three months or so what we call maintenance uh, or continuation uh, electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. 
So it's not a it's not a permanent uh, fix uh, like so, so much of medicine and so much of psychiatry. You know, uh, it's something that moves things back into a healthy range for a time. Uh, but we didn't know how it was working. It, it definitely helped, but but it was for a scientist. It was very it was satisfying to help the the patient to to have, take somebody who was you know in just horrific psychological distress uh, and and put them into a, a state where they could go back and do their work and 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 live with their friends and family and be happy for some time. That was great, but we had no idea what and still don't uh, what was going on there. Why is this? Uh, seizure that we give the patient, you know, we, and it's it's done in a pretty refined way these days. the The patient's body is paralyzed, so there's no physical, you know, seizure. It's it's all happening in the in the brain, and it's it's a safe procedure. But still, it it it's not specific, right? We're, you're causing a general pattern of activity through the brain of the patient, and and this astonishing psychiatric effect is created. I I, I clearly it it was. A mystery still is, and I was unsatisfied by that. There were early efforts at the time of, of other brain stimulation treatments. There was a vagus nerve stimulation. There's a, as you know, there are the nerves that run, uh, the 10th cranial nerve that comes from uh, the brain stem and goes down to innervate the heart and the abdomen. Also sends fibers back to the brain, and you can put a little cuff around the the nerve and and stimulate the brain uh, through the neck, which which is kind of interesting. A little little highway to the brain. But the effects, uh, although it it became approved, FDA approved for depression, the effects were very small on the population level, very inconsistent. Likewise, we had transcranial magnetic stimulation, which was in its early days then as well, which was a, a you know, it's a it's a treatment where you can non-invasively stimulate a tiny patch of the brain by putting a, a rapidly changing magnetic field uh, near the, the 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 scalp of the patient. Effects small on the population level did get FDA approved, but still not fully understood. So all these all these treatments, and of course none of the medications to this day do we fully understand their mechanisms of action. So there's a lot of mystery, and so I came from my psychiatry residency fully aware that, that essentially the entire field was unmoored from scientific understanding. No fault of the practitioners, no discredit to them. It was just not known and we didn't have the tools and techniques. We had no specific way of causing something to happen to a particular kind of cell. All these treatments are, are non-specific. A seizure all through the brain, uh, you know, a, a stimulation of a nerve, wherever that nerve may go, known but not specifically related to any psychiatric uh, uh, symptom. Uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, yeah, you can stimulate a little patch of, of the brain, but we don't know where depression comes from, where anxiety comes from. Is it this patch or that patch or that patch? No deep level of understanding uh, uh, was present. And, and of course, the medications act all through the brain without cell type specificity. So that was the, that was the setting. And then, you know, to answer your question then is, you know, Clearly, uh, basic science. You know, how could you build an approach to give you s some some kind of uh, precise causality? And that was that was the the context. Well, I want to dive really deep into this because it is essentially um, the skyscraper of your life. I mean, look if you if you retired tomorrow from medicine and science, Carl, if you dis tomorrow decided you were going to go surfing for the rest of your life. You would have already accomplished more than that of a hundred scientists. Um, so I want to I want to come to this in detail, but before I do, I want the viewers and the listeners to get a little bit more of an understanding of the brain structure because we're going to be talking about structures of the brain. We're going to be talking about the cells of the brain, and. Um, I wonder what the easiest way to do this is. Maybe we can start about the brain and its three layers, and what you know we talk about them through our evolution maybe and how each one added to the next but but each one has a subset of functions I, i'll really defer to you carl this is your domain and not mine but um mm -hmm. maybe we just take a step back and really give people a sense of of some neuroanatomy some neurophysiology what neurons are what axons are how chemicals get mm -hmm. transmitted i think investing some time in this now will really enable people to understand the depth and breadth of your literally world-changing discovery. Well, 
Well, thank you for the, first of all, the, the gracious uh, uh, comments. I, we have a long way to go, though, and I'm not, uh, and maybe it's many lifetimes uh, ahead. There, there are very deep mysteries in the, in the brain that we have much, much work to do. Exciting, fun work, but much work to do to, to get to where we want to be. But uh, it is, it is a, an exciting moment, and, we've, and, and what we've been able to accomplish has, has been uh, thrilling. Um, and, and it's a testament to all the amazing people that, that we've been able to, to, to get together to work on this. And, and indeed, the brain is, is something It's very compelling. Uh, it's so interesting and mysterious. The cells in the brain are more complex structurally than any other cell. They're in our brains, there are uh, approximately 90 billion neurons, that's with a B. Each one of them is, it's a self-contained unit. It's covered by a, a membrane, but it can generate electricity. It's got little channels, little pores in its surface that can generate little electrical impulses. And that's how you can have a single neuron that projects from one part of the brain to another, or from one part of the brain to the spinal cord, and or it can send connections through its axon, its outgoing wire, uh, effectively to many parts of the brain. And it sends that information in the form of electricity down its axon, down its outgoing uh, uh, connection. And the connections are received by the downstream cells through little structures called dendrites. And the interface from one cell to the next is called a synapse. And in most cases, information gets across that little gap from one cell to another in the form of chemicals. So the, the electricity triggers release of a chemical. The chemical drifts across this tiny little gap that's some tens of nanometers. And then it acts on receptors in the other side, the postsynaptic side, and, and that creates a new burst of electricity in that downstream cell. So that's the electrochemical process that, of information flow. Now you've got this going on in 90 billion neurons at the same time. They're all, maybe they form 10,000 or even 100,000 synapses each. Their wiring is incredibly complex. Uh, uh, um, there's some structure to it. There are collections of axons that may travel together, but then they also bifurcate and separate in incredibly complex ways. And all of that's in the brain. And then there's some structure to it, as you alluded to. Uh, and one way we can think about this is, is indeed evolutionarily. We're vertebrates, okay? That means we have a backbone and we've got a certain organization to our brain. Uh, in my lab, we have fish and we have mice and we have rats. And then I also do clinical work. These are all vertebrates from fish to us. We all have the basic vertebrate body plan and brain plan. And but evolution has given us, obviously we have much bigger brains than, than fish do, and uh, a couple things have happened over the course of, of you know, hundreds of millions of years, is that first of all, we've scaled everything up, we've taken the same structures, we've added many more cells to them, uh, and that lets us do more complex things. And we've also added new things on top. And so in the surface of the brain, there's what we call the cortex, uh, uh, which means literally the, the surface of, of, the, of the brain. It's like the, the rind of a melon, except in human beings, it's, it's quite thin. It's just a, a, a few millimeters uh, uh, thick. And within that few millimeters, there are six separate layers within that cortex or rind. Uh, and those are layers of cells. So there are six layers of cells in this sort of shawl or, or rind covering the, the brain. And then all the wiring coming out from that cortex uh, goes to deep structures uh, and our, our cortex is much more advanced. The fish don't really have something like that, but they've got the deeper structures. They've got the interchanges and, and the movement control and the, the uh, uh, arousal systems and the sleep systems. And, and there are structures deep in the brain like the hypothalamus that govern all the primary needs of, of salt balance and uh, avoiding danger and mating and sleeping. Uh, thermoregulation. These deep structures are common to every vertebrate. We have a hypothalamus. The fish has a hypothalamus. These deep structures are shared and ancestral among all vertebrates. And so you've got this, you've got these deeper structures that are, that are conserved and ancient, and you've got this, uh, in, in us, we've got this uh, surface structure that is uh, in, incredibly elaborated in, in our lineage and, and uh, is responsible for some of the most complex and, and, and mysterious things we do. 
And, and But the great thing is, and mice sort of sit somewhere in between. They have the cortex uh, that we have, and it's amazingly similar. It's got the same six layers. It's got the same kinds of neurons. They're connected in the same way. It's just much smaller uh, than what we have. And so by looking at the fish and the mice and ourselves, uh, we can uh, piece together a lot by studying the cells and the connections that make things happen. And, and that's the context of, that, that we come to as a neuroscientist. And, and what about this, this first layer, the brainstem, this kind of most primordial layer that handles so many of these functions when we're not even thinking about it, like, like breathing? I mean, what, w how conserved is that across all of these models? Yeah, the brainstem is, is highly, highly conserved. The, you know, in the brainstem and in the midbrain, we have clusters of neurons, uh, like the dopamine neurons and the serotonin neurons and the uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine neurons. They're all uh, uh, clustered there in the brainstem in and around uh, other cells that govern uh, the movement of the uh, muscles of the face and the, the neck and that send information down like the vagus nerve that we talked about send information down to the rest of the body these basic structures in the brainstem are are highly conserved fish and mice and human beings uh, all have them there's a little bit of different shaping and arrangement but it's basically the same logic and are there neurons as the way you describe it it sounds like a neuron might have mostly just serotonin so when that neuron fires at the end of its synapse serotonin is the only chemical that comes out is that is that the case for neurons that each one only can emit one neurochemical so it's a largely binary signal or are there any neurons that can secrete more than one neurotransmitter a relatively recent understanding has been that it, there there are multiple neurotransmitters that can be released by the same neuron we still refer, for example, to the dopamine neurons as dopamine neurons because that's, that what's, that's what makes them special. That's what they can do that other neurons can't do. But what we've discovered recently, what the field has discovered recently, is that dopamine neurons, some of them also release another neurotransmitter called glutamate, uh, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It stimulates the downstream cells. Other dopamine neurons can release... Uh, a different one called GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It shuts down the, the cell that's receiving the signal. So there's actually a great deal of complexity, and that's not all. There are also other things that can be released at the same time, things we call neuropeptides. And there's a, a lot of complexity on the other side of the synapse, too. Different cells have different receptors for the different chemicals that can do totally different things. You can have a, a receptor for glutamate that makes excitation happen, or you can have another receptor for glutamate that doesn't do that, but makes uh, a longer pattern of modulation happen that's not even a direct excitation. So that's just a, a, just a flavor of the complexity. Uh, but broadly speaking, you'll see us still refer to things like dopamine and, and serotonin neurons because that's the first level of complexity. So prior to the work that we're going to get into here, what tools existed to really try to establish causality between the stimulation of one region of the brain and some sort of response, be it a phenotype or an impulse or, I mean, was there ever any way to imagine how one part of the hypothalamus was responsible for a type of thought or emotion? I mean, how, how, how was that probed? Yeah, this, this was a big challenge that neuroscience faced, which is, is finding out what actually uh, matters for function. And, and what we did have, we had ways of listening in. We had uh, ways of uh, putting in electrodes to, to listen, uh, to pick up electrical patterns of activity. You can put an electrode in the cortex or in the hypothalamus or in the brainstem, and you can pick up the chatter of neurons as these little electrical impulses go by. And you could use the same electrode, you could also stimulate. You could send current in through this wire, effectively, that, you, that you've placed. Um, and yeah, that, that has an effect. And so you can, you can make things happen by just sending current into the brain. Uh, 
And at some level, though, this is just a scaled down version of the electroconvulsive therapy we talked about, which is also just current being put into the brain. It causes things to happen, but there's no cell specificity. Every single neuron in the brain is electrical. And all parts of every neuron are electrical, not just the cell body itself that has the DNA in it, but also every part of the axon, every part of the dendrite, all electrical. And so if you send in current to a spot in the brain, even with a tiny electrode, you're affecting every single cell near the electrode. And not just that, every little bit of wiring that happens to be going through there. So there's no cell type specificity because every cell is electrical. And that's still though, there, there, there's work you can do. And so you can, you could stimulate a region of the brain and see if that causes something to happen in the animal. And there was a great deal of, of really foundational work in, in neuroscience going around and stimulating different parts of the brain. It was discovered that if you put an electrode in, in the parts of the brain where dopamine neurons live and where the axons come out, that uh, rodents will really work hard for that. They, they like that, uh, it seems. Uh, we can infer that because they will uh, press a lever thousands of times a day uh, to get a burst of electricity to the dopamine neurons. And, and so that little clues like that are built up over, over time. But, but then there was always complexity. As we dove deeper into it, we realized, wait, this is not just the dopamine neurons. In this region of the brain, there are a lot of other cells and connections. So is it really the dopamine neurons? It's, it's this region, but what really are, are the cells? And so there was a lot of um, uncertainty in the field as to which cells were actually doing uh, what. And so we had that, we had, but, and, but then there was not a good way to turn things off also. And so in, in science, we like to add things and see what happens. And that's testing whether something is sufficient to cause an effect. And we like doing that, that, that tells you something. But then we also like to take away uh, something of interest and we can see what, what is lost with that. And that's, that's called, you know, that's testing the necessity of something. How much is that needed? And so we would, we would have liked to turn off cells and say, okay, now what's different in the, in the animal and their behavior? And there was not a great way of doing that. Crude ways, if you stimulate really hard with an electrode, you could effectively exhaust the cells and make them not fire anymore. And that was sort of the state of the art, both clinically and research-wise, in trying to create a local inhibition. But again, not cell type specific at all because all the cells are electrical. And that's the kind of situa situation that, that we found ourselves in. Not too different clinically or basic, uh, you know, no cell type specificity. So do you remember where you were, what you were doing, the very first time you learned what a channel opsin was? So this is a, an interesting uh, 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 thread that the, there are these uh, plants that make, and, and small plants, in fact, single-celled plants that make uh, channel rhodopsins. Uh, these are uh, single proteins that live in the, that are placed in the, in the surface membrane of cells, but microbial cells, not, not in our cells, in, in algae, single-celled algae. And related molecules are present in ancient forms of bacteria. And these, these had been known to exist for years. Uh, and, and this class of, of protein is really interesting because they're light activated electricity generators. Uh, these are single bits of biology, single biomolecules that do an amazing job. They receive a photon of light and they move charged particles, ions, across the surface of the cell. Now, there's a huge family of these. These are called the microbial opsins, and a subfamily of them is called the channel rhodopsins. Now, what's amazing is that these proteins were known broadly in biology, in biochemistry, for decades. They'd been discovered in 1971 uh, by Dieter Osterhelt and Walter Stokinius, uh, who are at UCSF. And this was part of the training of uh, biochemists, biologists in, in Lubert Stryer's beautiful biochemistry textbook. There's a page on the bacteria rhodopsins, and there's a this was that's that's where I learned about it. Uh, you know these these 
proteins. Uh, the, the, they have a photo cycle, it's called. They have a, a choreography of movements of the protein after the photon hits that lead to an ion, a charged particle, moving across the membrane of the cell. So this, but th so this was, you know, a, a class of proteins that was was well known, uh, and and it turned out that these microbial uh, opsins turned out to be the key for for optogenetics, the technology we developed that brought this cell type specific uh, causality uh, that made it uh, possible. Um, I, I want to understand this a bit more, Carl. How? Because yeah. so it sounds like okay, because. I also had Lubert Stryer as a professor. I have his textbook. It's one of the few textbooks I've still kept. First of all, I don't remember that. So, I mean, like that might be a page in that book, but I was not paying attention during that lecture. So it's it sounds to me like you knew about these even back in medical school. When did the idea come to you that said, wait a minute, I can now genetically insert these things into neurons and effectively put a digital switch into a single neuron. How and when did that idea cross your mind? Yeah, so there was a coalition of, uh, a coalescence of different threads that happened uh, that were partly plausibility threads. Um, and, and if you look at this uh, historically, anybody in theory could have thought about this and tried this in, you know, in the late 80s or all through the 90s. These, these genes were known. Somebody could have put them into neurons and tried this, but it wasn't technically plausible for many reasons. There were not, until the 90s and particularly the late 90s, there were not good ways of introducing genes into neurons. Neurons are a little bit uh, tricky. They're very finicky and sensitive. And, and I knew this because this was, you know, was, this was a theme in my uh, PhD work and also in my postdoc work, you know, can we, how can we get genes into, into neurons? Even in a, a cultured neuron preparation, it's not easy. And so that was, that was certainly part of it, part of why, I mean, why nobody had, had, had tried this before. But in the late uh, 90s, uh, that started to change and, and I did an experiment introducing uh, genes into, into neurons as part of my postdoctoral work in the Malenka lab. That was in, and so this was something I was, I was good at. I'd, I'd uh, developed the, the viral tools and the ways of introducing genes in that were, that were plausible. Tell, tell folks a little bit about how that works. Um, yeah. We're obviously, you know, these days I think even the lay person is somewhat familiar with genetic modifications, people have some sense of how these have even been used to help develop vaccines and things like that. But um, let's start from a place assuming people don't even really know the difference between DNA and RNA, and just explain how you could use this thing called a virus to do your bidding with respect to the insertion yeah. of a foreign gene. So this is, and this is by no means, uh, a minor thing. In some ways, this is this is the whole ball of wax, as we say. How do you get a gene into a neuron in a in a specific way? So this is the technological aspect of this. In some ways, is everything. And so it's definitely worth the time to to talk about this. Um, you know, how do you how do you do it? Well, so uh, DNA is is the instruction manual for making uh, uh, proteins, uh, things like proteins, uh, biomolecules that have a job. Each gene is a bit of DNA. Uh, it might be uh, a, a sequence of what we call nucleotides. They have A, G, C, and T. There's four kinds of them, and they come in different uh, uh, sequences. And by the order in which these nucleotides appear, that is a code. That's the genetic code that dictates which protein will be made, a biomolecule that, that has a particular structure and, and a job that comes from its structure, like being an a channel or something in the surface of a, of a cell that receives a photon and lets uh, charged particles go across. That's the protein. The instructions for making it are encoded in the, in the DNA in the gene. Um, and so that, so how do you get that, that gene into a cell? Well, it's not so easy. Uh, you know, these days, um, uh, particularly with the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, I think the general public is, is much more aware now of how this uh, can be done. Viruses, uh, and there are many kinds of viruses, they are 
uh, little bits of biology that basically exist to get DNA and RNA uh, into cells. And so they have a little bit of this genetic code material, DNA or RNA, and they have that encased in a coating that might have some lipids or fats and some proteins. And then that f floats through, uh, liquid floats through the air, hits a cell and fuses with the cell, gets the DNA or the RNA into the cell. And then that triggers the creation of new virus particles. And then that's how the virus uh, spreads. So viruses are professional introducers of genetic material in the cells. They are extremely good at that. They are evolved uh, for that. Um, and this, this DNA RNA distinction is, is interesting. Some viruses work with DNA. Some are RNA. What is RNA? This is also something that the coronavirus pandemic has brought to the public's uh, uh, attention uh, very recently. That's the uh, step in between DNA and protein. It turns out for various reasons it's, it's useful to have an intermediate step. First the DNA gets turned into RNA, very similar structure, but then that gets turned into the, the protein. Some viruses work with DNA, some with RNA. So this, it turns out, is uh, then very useful for the biologist because if you want to get a gene into a cell, and in, in, in my case suppose you want to get a gene for making a uh, light activated uh, channel. If you want to get that into a cell, well, how do you do it? Well, you get the DNA into the cell. And what's the best way to do that? Well, uh, use a virus. And there are viruses that are dangerous and uh, lethal, but there are also uh, safer, weaker viruses. And then there are modified versions even of those that are that, that uh, virologists have engineered uh, to be extremely safe to have lost the ability to propagate from one cell to another, but can do that first step, can uh, bring DNA into one set of cells, and then the life cycle, if you were, if you will, stops at that point. And those are the cell, those are the viruses that that uh, that I had experience with from my uh, 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 postdoctoral work. Uh, safe, modified uh, viruses that can be used to shuttle bits of DNA in, into cells. And so that's the core uh, technology. And again, this was a, a recent, uh, relatively recent thing, and particularly for neurons, uh, a, a relatively recent thing. It was the technology for doing that was not uh, uh, so clear in, in the past. The other thing, though, I want to point out is that this, um, uh, the, there were uh, many people uh, who who were thinking about this and trying this, and we did. Uh, from my lab published the first paper that used a microbial opsin to get light sensitivity, but it was, as it turned out, uh, quite a, a close call. Uh, we published uh, the paper from my lab in, in uh, 2005, and that came out in the summer of 2005. Uh, within uh, six months, uh, uh, several other papers came out. Uh, they all were submitted right after ours was, was published, and so clearly uh, many people had been thinking about this. They saw our paper came out, and then then rushed to submit theirs. Um, and these were these were big time labs. Uh, you know, people who who were very respected and and thoughtful, including. This is something I didn't know, but but uh, the uh, brother of my PhD advisor. My PhD advisor was Dick Chen. His brother Roger Chen was a Nobel laureate. Uh, uh, for his work with green fluorescent protein. Turned out he was also working on this uh, as well. Uh, there's a, I talked to him at great length about this. Of course, he did okay. He, he got a Nobel Prize for, for other work, and, but this was, all this was going on before his, his Nobel Prize. And so he was quite, uh, I think, frustrated that he wasn't able to get uh, 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 to this moment as, as quickly. So it was a, it was a sort of a, a broad, uh, uh, awareness in the field that the, the technology was now available. We could introduce uh, genes into neurons, that these microbial opsins existed. People had wanted to get cell type specificity uh, for a long time um, with neurostimulation. Francis Crick of uh, DNA uh, double helix uh, fame had been calling for this sort of technology for years. In fact, in 1999, he'd even suggested that not only did we need a way in neuroscience to control individual cells, individual cell types, 
But he said maybe light would be a good way of doing it. He didn't have an idea of how to do it, but he said, you know, light would have some good properties. It would be fast, it would be relatively non-invasive, photons could scatter through uh, tissue, and most neurons don't respond to light at baseline, unlike electricity, and so it would be a way of, of getting great specificity. So there was this, there was a, a broad uh, awareness that this, this kind of thing suddenly might be, might be possible. I have two unrelated questions, Carl, about this. Uh, the first is, when you introduce the virus, is it one virus that can introduce the gene to one neuron and that's it? But you said there's no replication capacity of the virus. So does that right. mean that the dose of the virus you give determines how many cells will pick up the channel? Uh, that's correct. So you can give uh, uh, a, a very high concentration of viral particles and that will mean that you get more cells. Also, you'll get more copies per cell. You can have multiple mm -hmm. viral particles uh, infecting the same cell, and that is actually very important. Another big issue with these microbial opsins is they generate tiny currents. They're not as uh, you know professional at generating huge currents as mammalian ion channels are, which was a big reason why I think a lot of people didn't uh, rush to this as well. People looked at those current sizes and said, nah, you know, this is not going to work. Most existing methods of, of introducing genes uh, gave you maybe one to seven copy numbers of the gene, as we say. So not, not enough to, to control a neuron. And that was a huge issue. But with the viral technologies, you could get hundreds or more copies of, of the gene per cell, and you could get uh, much bigger currents with these microbial uh, opsins. And so then ag there again, my experience with the viral tools was, was, was critical. And just give us a sense of the current. So when you talk about a normal mammalian neuron, how many do we measure these in picoamps, nanoamps? Yeah, picoamps and nanoamps are exactly right. So uh, a, a typical- An action potential is how many picoamps? Yeah. So uh, a couple ways we, we, we can look at it. So the the- the action potential, this is this blip of electricity that uh, propagates uh, through the, uh, down the axon of a neuron. It can be triggered by uh, signals that are in the, are in the order of uh, 100 to 200 picoamps. And then it becomes a, a voltage impulse that's about 100 millivolts and that propagates down the cell. So if you're in the hundreds of picoamp range, you're, you're in business for, uh, controlling uh, neurons. A single opsin is capable of what? Um, vastly uh, less than that. And so a, a couple issues come up. So first of all, what we, what we found is that uh, if you don't have um, a, a high copy number, the currents that you're generating are, are on the single or less uh, picoamp level. We haven't done, because the currents are so small, you, you typically don't even do the experiment you're asking, the uh, single channel uh, current measurements. Since then, out of scientific curiosity, you know, we and others have looked at, at, the, uh, at the currents that are generated and they're, they're extraordinarily small. We only get uh, the, to the hundreds of picoamp level by probably expressing, you know, 100,000 uh, uh, to a million uh, uh, opsins uh, per cell. And so we're, this, this was a, the, the key issue. There was many orders of magnitude, as we say, you know, ten, you know several uh, factors of 10 away uh, from where we needed to be with these, uh, with these opsins, unless there was a way of, of, of introducing many genes and getting very robust, safe expression. How do you introduce the virus? So it, let's just say we're talking about a mouse here um, and you decide you want to test in this particular region of the pons. So a part of the brainstem, you, you want to exactly get it there. How do you direct the virus to exactly the cell you want to get this specificity? So this is, this is the other uh, technological challenge that had to be faced. It was not obvious how this would be done. Uh, where would the specificity come from? Yes, uh, none of the cells respond to light. Yes, maybe we could add a gene that makes the cells respond to light. But wait, 
hang on a minute, where's the specificity going to come from? How do we get this gene only into the cells we're interested in? Well, all right, what could you do? You could concentrate the virus and do a very focal injection into, let's say, the ponds. And so you could create a little hotspot of virus, uh, and then that virus would get into all the cells that are in and around the, the, that spot in the ponds. And that's, that's good. That gives you some spatial specificity. You're now at a, at a spot. And that is already a big leap beyond the electrode because the electrode and the virus both so far in how I've described them are not cell type specific, but the electrode is getting all the, is going to be stimulating all the axons that happen to be going by. If you do a viral injection at one spot, viruses are not very good at getting into axons. They're just going to get the cells, the little spherical cell bodies that live in that region. And so right away that gives you some specificity. You're getting less of the the cross streams of activity being stimulated. But it's not enough because well, even if you're just getting the cells, the cell bodies that are there, there are many different kinds. There are the dopamine cells, but right next to mm -hmm. them there are the GABA cells, and next to them are the glutamate cells, and, and they're all jumbled up together. And there you're not too different from the electrode. Now if you put in light, you're still going to be stimulating all these cells. And so what you need is a way to make the uh, production of the opsin cell type specific. Okay, so how are you going to do that? Well, the virus, there, there were many possibilities we, we could think about, and this took probably, till to, to we really solved optogenetics, probably took till 2009 because this was, this was the critical issue. Um, how do you get a, a versatile, generalizable way of targeting specific cell types? And back in 2004, 2005, there were some possibilities that we and others could imagine. You could try to imagine engineering the virus uh, capsid, this coating of the virus that has proteins on it. There were theoretical ways and even possible practical ways of engineering capsid proteins so that they would only target one kind of cell because that kind of cell had right. something else on its surface and maybe we could create some kind of lock and key mechanism. Yeah, so just like a coronavirus, is, uh, its lock and key basically works through the ACE2 receptor yep. if you knew what a potential surface protein or receptor was on the dopaner, dopaminergic neuron, that could be your entry. That would have been the first thought that would have come to my naive mind. Yep. And, and that was plausible. Uh, uh, it could, could work. It, it had some, you know, some drawbacks, which are that you'd have to, first of all, we didn't have that richness of understanding. Uh, it wasn't as if there was some lookup table. Okay. <laughs> right. Dopamine neuron has this, so then make put this on that. That, that didn't exist and still doesn't, honestly. So it was more just, okay, there's going to be a lot of work. Every time you want to target a particular cell type, you're going to have to now do some deep dive into all the proteins it expresses uh, and also all the cells that are nearby that you don't want to target and make sure you're that not whatever your strategy is, yep. is, not, is not giving you some cross reactivity. And so we, you know, initially plausible, and then as you start to think about it more, you're like, oh, this, I mean... This is, this is never going to be versatile, generalizable, practical, and, and indeed it still isn't today. So, so that wasn't it. Now, another strategy is that is, is working with DNA. Uh, each, each gene, each bit of DNA in chromosomes, in genomes, uh, has this code for the protein, but also near it, it's got another bit of DNA that's called a promoter or an enhancer. Uh, and this is a bit of DNA that doesn't code for a protein. What it does is it attracts uh, what are called uh, transcription factors, things that decide whether that bit of DNA gets turned into RNA and then into protein. They, by changing the structure, by changing things around the gene, they determine whether this gene is expressed at all. It could sit there quiet and not make the RNA and the protein, or it could be active, make the RNA and the protein. It turns out that is critical because that was a, a, a path forward. We could work with the bits of DNA near genes, promoters and enhancers, 
this gave us some leverage. Not all of it, but, but some of the leverage. And if you think about this, well, think about a dopamine neuron again. So what is a dopamine neuron? Well, it makes dopamine, and it releases dopamine. Okay, now how does it make dopamine? Well, it's got its own biomolecules that make dopamine. It's got enzymes that turn other precursor chemicals into dopamine. Now those enzymes are made chiefly in dopamine neurons. And why are they only made in dopamine neurons and not in your big toe neuron? Well, it's because- Or, or more importantly, not in the serotonergic, serotonergic neuron right next door. I mean, that's the key insight is, is the, the, you exploit yes. the promoters that are making unique enzymes to a particular neurotransmitter. Exactly right. And so each, it turns out each cell type is defined by its job, just as in many case we, cases we are defined mm -hmm. by our, our jobs. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a critical thing because a professional dopamine producing cell is gonna have by its dopamine enzyme encoding genes, it's going to have promoters or enhancers that are that dictate in this cell type this gene will be active. And so what we did was we said, okay, let's see which of those bits of DNA, those promoters and enhancers, can we borrow from, let's say, the tyrosine hydroxylase gene. This is a gene that helps make dopamine. Mm -hmm. We could go take a little bit of its promoter and we could put that in front of the channel rhodopsin gene, package that whole thing up into virus infect cells. Okay, now you, inject you could almost virus. administer it systemically at this point, and it's going to go exactly. And this is a very elegant solution, Carl. Yeah, yeah, it, and and in fact, the, the systemic thing now, in some ways, is is done in some settings. Uh, it's more costly actually because you, you have to, to use a much higher load. Make a lot more virus, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and actually, the focal injection gives us other advantages. So so we still uh, actually prefer the the focal injection. But you're right uh, that the specificity is now uh, in large part taken care of by the the promoter. And so you can inject that in, the virus gets into all the cells, the serotonergic cells and the dopaminergic cells, but the gene is only expressed yep. and the opsin is only made in the dopamine cells as a result of it. So I have another technical question, Carl. So yeah. let's go back to your garden variety cold causing adenovirus, right? So yeah. you're out and about in the park or you're on an airplane and you know you happen to catch this cold from somebody. Um, that adenovirus is going to go and it's going to infect the epithelial cells, you know, lining your trachea, probably get into your lung or something like that. Um, it's going to incorporate its genetic material into your machinery, which will then make its proteins. That's how it replicates. Um, and of course the immune system is very good at recognizing this because it's either going to put soluble antibodies to antigens on the surface, or if it's done through, uh, through class one and class two, the T cell system is going to come and through antigen presentation will recognize foreign antigens being presented on the surface of a cell. So in other words, the host cell, your cell will hold up its little hand and say, look, I've got this little protein in me. It's the T cell will come and destroy that cell. How do you prevent the immune system from standing by watching you do all of this very elegant genetic engineering and then just coming along and big footing you because it says wait a minute that channel opsin's not supposed to be here are you just getting lucky that it's not being presented on the mhc class one or class two as a peptide or meaning pieces of it because obviously it would be much larger than a nine to eight amino acid peptide but yep uh this is a great question this was a another uh energy barrier uh to tackling this strategy, uh, everybody thought, and rightly so, this is a potential concern, right? The immune system's gonna attack the cells making this foreign protein and, and, and kill them. Um, well, a couple things helped us here. Uh, one is uh, that we were working in the brain. And, and as you know, the brain is what we call an immune privileged uh, organ. The uh, T cells and B cells that patrol our bodies don't have uh, free access uh, to the brain. They're kept out, uh, and that's a pretty interesting situation. Uh, why is that? Uh, a lot of interesting evolutionary speculations to that, but it's a fact, uh, and so they, they can't get in. And, and without that, uh, no doubt things uh, along the lines of what you're, you're saying would be relevant. And we've actually even recently explored this sort of thing. Uh, you know, we, people have been interested in peripheral not, not central, peripheral 
optogenetics, and it works, but people see loss of the the expression and the cells expressing mm -hmm. the uh, opsins over time, over months, and, and the immune response is certainly part of that. But in the brain, that, that doesn't happen. And so that's a great question. Uh, and, and here we, we definitely leverage the immune privilege. So this was, this was very helpful, Carl. I think, you know, maybe for the listener, they thought, boy, these guys went into a lot of detail here. But I think this was really important because I think only now can we understand the magnitude of a what you and your team accomplished in what scientifically is considered a nanosecond i mean in four years that you were able to do everything you just said and now we're in 2009 2010 you have the capacity to introduce these opsins to very specific cells such that you could say two neurons which are different I can put this gene into one and not the other. This is unparalleled. So you now have this capacity to use photons to turn neurons on and off with precision that could never be achieved anatomically under anatomic resolution. That's right. So what was the first question you sought to ask using this technology from a from a neurobiology and neurochemical standpoint well uh you know we, we've talked about dopamine a lot and in 2009 there was a an experiment that that i and the whole field had had wanted to 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 know which really is is it the dopamine neurons is their activity what what animals are are uh, getting from this stimulation of that region, or is it something else, some other cell type that's nearby? Is it the GABAergic or the serotonergic cells that are we know are are right nearby? And and in two thousand nine, we did that experiment. So we introduced uh, a channel rhodopsin, an excitatory channel rhodopsin, just into the dopamine neurons of this spot in in uh, the midbrain that's called the ventral tegmental area or VTA. It's got all these other kinds of cells, but that's where the dopamine neurons also live. And we used a, a souped up form of the promoter strategy I just told you about um, to get the gene into the dopamine neurons. And we asked a very simple question. If you have a mouse and you give it a a two-room house to live in. It's a very simple house, two rooms. I can go back and forth from one room to the other. So kind of just like a New York apartment. <laughs> yeah, on a good day, <laughs> yeah. Um, then what if you turned on the laser light, the light that activated the channel rhodopsins on the dopamine neurons, but you did that only when the animal was in one room and not the other room? And what we found is that if you did that, the animals preferred to be in the room where the laser light had been applied compared to the other room, which was equivalent in every other way. So, so this that, would be the analogy, just to, sorry to interrupt, but just to make a really crude scenario. You could have done this experiment a hundred years ago if you said, I'm gonna put sugar water in one room and not in the other is there a preference that the animal has for it presumably it would always want to go to the room with sugar water or cocaine or something pleasurable but yet here you were able to do that without anything other than the excitation of a particular neuron exactly right and and in fact this test is an old test it's called the conditioned place preference test and yeah it's a the animal now prefers a place and and it's because of it's uh, it, the conditioning is how it was done classically, just as you're saying. You would pair uh, something good, like cocaine or or sugar or food or a social interaction, a mate, something like that, and you would see later that the mouse would choose to spend time in there, revealing to us by its behavior that this thing was positive in value to it. And you can do the flip side too. You can do a negative thing. You can make, make it feel mildly nauseous. You can give it lithium, which we give to, to patients too, and one side effect you, you can have is mild nausea. You can give a, a, a mouse a mild nausea that way, it, but only in one room, and then it'll avoid that, that room, and that's conditioned place aversion. So the animal can report to us 
the, the sign, if you will, the, the valence, positive or negative, of its experience by where it chooses to spend time. And that's incredibly valuable. This harkens back to, you know, that my very first, you know, wanting to be a, a neurosurgeon because a human being could tell me what they were feeling. Well, of course, a human being is more eloquent, but behaviorally, a mouse can report whether it, it, something is a positive or, or negative. Uh, value uh, to it. And, and that test, Carl, when you're looking for the positive valence, how, what's the frequency with which you would expect that to be the case? I mean, presumably it's more than 5149 in favor of the dopamine firing. Just give us a sense of if you ran that experiment a uh, hundred or you ran a simulation of that experiment a hundred times and you always fired the, um, the dopaminergic neuron with your opsin, how many times out of a hundred would it go to the positively valence side? We try to keep things in, you, you can make this as extreme as you want, uh, and and uh, so the answer is a bit flexible, uh, but what, with typical rewards, with sugar water, with a social interaction, peop, the sort of the number you're looking for is, is sort of 70-30 or 80-20. Or uh, that's kind of the level to which uh, the mouse will prefer one chamber versus another, one room versus another in terms of how it devotes its time. But you can actually, you can make that, you know, you can push those numbers both optogenetically using light or with, with stimuli uh, up or down uh, by making the experience more extreme. Um, it's, it's quite a flexible test. And, and we, had, we had later versions of this, you know, that, that in some ways the animal's expressing its, its uh, subjective sense, we think, by where it's choosing to spend time. You can also make a more souped up version of that test where the animal actually has to work to get the light by pressing a lever or poking its nose in a, in, a, in a little hole, a nose poke, and trigger a pulse of light by each of its actions. So this is a, this is a, a, a slightly more advanced version where you say, how hard will you work for light? How hard will you work for a, a precisely defined set of activity in your precisely defined dopamine neurons? And, and if, if you deliver uh, light, you can get an animal to press a lever thousands of times a day uh, to get that, that light. And so now there is, you know, no doubt that the activity of dopamine neurons uh, in this way is, is positive. And it's not just positive, it can be extremely uh, positive. Animals will work very, very hard to get it. it, it that's, it's just amazing that this could be done. Let's keep going. What, you know, I, I can only imagine how excited you and your colleagues were by this finding. And of course, it probably only whets your appetite for the breadth of questions that you now want to ask. Um, where was the clinical community in recognizing the value of this tool? So you have all of these questions that have for, I think it's safe to say thousands of years been in other words, even before the codification of, of, of medicine as we know it today, we've always wondered things like what regulates mood? How can two people anatomically be nearly identical and yet one be happy and one be sad? Where do memories reside? What is a memory? What is a feeling? What is a thought, right? All of these things. And, and yet I, I, I suspect that this experiment, as simple as it was, for the first time gave you a profound sense of optimism that you now have a tool finally to ask questions. So you're splitting your time here, right? You're still an on the ward psychiatrist. So on the one hand, you're doing kind of the, the most cutting edge science in the field. And at the other end, you're still trying to help people who are bringing these questions to your mind. How many of your colleagues in psychiatry not necessarily your direct colleagues at Stanford, but just, I mean, the community more broadly. How appreciated was this tool 10 years ago? You know, it's, it's actually uh, very interesting that you ask that. The appreciation in the, the scientific psychiatry uh, realm, and these are, you know, clinicians, psychiatrists who also have some interest in, in the, the science side, the appreciation was very quick uh, and immediate um, because I think the psychiatrists know and knew 
uh, better than anyone else how much specificity was was needed and wanted in, in, in their field. And you know, I had this was you know, by the time we got to 2009, the generality of that targeting method was was key because then people knew, okay, this wasn't just a, a parlor trick, a one-off, you know, a demonstration that you could get some kind of photosensitivity in one cell once, that this was actually a generalizable, versatile method. You could apply this principle to you know, any cell type. It was done in freely moving mammals, uh, you know, and mice, of course, being you know, having our same brain structures, our cortex, our hypothalamus, our all and everything in between. The significance and the opportunity was was pretty clear to everyone by 2009, uh, particularly the, the the psychiatrists. And so then there was a there was a lot of uh, a great deal of interest, and because the technique was was generalizable, uh, it was very widely adopted. And we sent the the uh, the clones, the, the bits of DNA, to thousands of labs around the world, and 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 many thousands of discoveries were made by other labs, which was great. After that, uh, uh, really showing that that anybody could use it to tackle any question, any any disease, any symptom uh, in, in diverse animals. So after two thousand nine, it was off and running. The between 04 and, and 09, though, uh, that's those were those were hard times because we were still putting the pieces together, solving the light delivery, solving the virus uh, issues, getting the cell type targeting to be generalizable and versatile. And I would say it wasn't really until 2009 that we could look at this and say, "Yeah, yeah, we've we, we've we've done it at this point." Was, um, was this work so funded it, by NIH? Yeah. So early on. I had uh, I had some initial trouble uh, getting grants, but then pretty quickly, uh, once once the opportunity became uh, clear, both the National Institute of Mental Health uh, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, two main uh, institutes of the NIH, uh, immediately uh, were were very supportive. And then later, we got a, a great deal of support from uh, DARPA. And from the National Science Foundation, and and then also from a from a number of private uh, donors, people who, in many cases, came through the psychiatry setting, friends or family members who had suffered from psychiatric disease, and they had heard about what we were doing and and wanted to support it. So we ended up getting, uh, you know, both federal and uh, nonprofit institutions and and private donors, and it all came together. But it but it but you know until. Really, until we had things working in this generalizable way, uh, times were a little bit tough. Well, I mean, it, it is it is again remarkable now as you sort of look back at it to think that um, a that it all worked out. Like, I mean, it is there's a hundred steps at which this couldn't that could, this could have failed. Um, That's right. And again, I'm still amazed that it really o only took four years. Although I'm sure there were times in there it felt like it was taking forever, but. Yes. But I mean, as you yeah. know, as a, you're you're such a historian of science as well. I mean, it is it is a remarkable period of time. Um, so so let's talk about some of the other questions that you wanted to probe with with this technology. So what about any of the other neurotransmitters or neurons in particular? Where 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 did you turn to next? Well, we uh, were particularly interested, you know, hearkening back to my you know what got me into psychiatry in the first place. You know, I, I wanted to understand internal states of mammals and how they can go wrong and, and create symptoms. And if you work with, with uh, animal subjects, with mice, uh, for example, you have to figure out what they can report that, that, that matters. And one thing they can report very well uh, are these universal things that all mammals experience, anxiety, uh, and uh, social interaction and caring for for offspring for young these are quintessential mammalian states that matter they can go wrong uh, and so I wanted to, to study them and I wanted to study them in ways that were now precise and causal and had to do with specific cell types and so one of the first things we did was anxiety and you know, as a psychiatrist, I I specialize in patients who suffer from depression, 
and also social difficulties, autism spectrum disorders. And a common theme in both autism and in depression, uh, anxiety is a big part of that. Uh, anxiety is not a small thing. Anxiety can be absolutely crushing to one's life, to one's interactions, to occupation, uh, to even being able to go out in the world. Um, this is a very potentially severe disorder in many people. Of course, anxiety though is also can exist in a normal healthy range too. Uh, and it's only it only becomes a psychiatric disorder when it exceeds that healthy range and verges into, or in many people unfortunately goes way beyond into a, a very pathological extreme. How do you define that maladaptive transformation from yeah. uh, normal anxiety, which I, I suppose you could even make the case if a person was incapable of experiencing anxiety, they could probably injure themselves and they might be socially quite destructive. So in other words, there must be some evolutionary basis for anxiety and self-preservation. Yes. Uh, but yes. as you point out, uh, I can't imagine anybody listening to this hasn't been personally experienced uh, or hasn't personally experienced or known somebody who has experienced anxiety that has crossed too far. But but it, I mean, is this something that falls into the DSM-5 where there's an actual criteria? I mean, there must be, right? Yes. Yeah, there are, and and in fact, it's the it's the the criterion uh, to, for rising to the level of disorder in in the in the psychiatric uh, uh, literature and in the DSM five or our diagnostic and statistical manual is that it's only a disorder if there's impairment in what we call social or occupational functioning. So you could have any symptom in psychiatry, even a hallucination for example, but if it's not impairing your life, your social or occupational function, we don't call it a disorder. And in fact, I've had patients who, who, were, who were hallucinating, but it was in a way that was not disrupting their life. I had a blind patient who had visual hallucinations, but he was, he was fine with them. They weren't uh, distressing to him, and so we wouldn't say it's a disorder. Mm. It's just something happening. So that's the criterion we use, and of course, it, it uh, is somewhat... Uh, you know, flexible because different people have different social and occupational situations. And, and this is a challenge we have in psychiatry, but maintaining that as a criterion is, is very good because it ensures that we only treat things that, that need to be treated. So that, then you think about anxiety, well, if you can't function, if you can't leave your apartment uh, to go to work, well, that's impairing your, your occupational functioning. And so that, that there are people who have anxiety easily in that realm or far beyond and those are people we, we want to help. On the flip side, as, as you point out, there are people who have risk-taking behavior that's extreme because they don't perceive or, or worry about threat, and, and that's also a problem. So anxiety, we, we need to, 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 to treat it in patients who are severely affected, and the problem is, in anxiety, there are uh, medications that help, but they come with uh, some problems. So. The most effective anti-anxiety medications are things that relate to, you know, uh, Valium and Xanax and, and Ativan. As you know, these are medications that work, uh, but they can be addictive. They can uh, cause the human being to adapt to the dose and to, to make it very difficult to stop them. Um, and, and these, do these cause... work? Do, do we think that they primarily work through their GABA? Agonism is that the yes, primary right. belief? Yeah. So they they you, you talked about GABA earlier. This is a relaxing, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, neuro neurotransmitter. This is a non excitatory. That's right. That's right. And that's exactly how these act. They they act in fact directly on the GABA uh, uh, receptor and they facilitate its its action. And so this is, um, but they they work. They're just they just have some some problems, and not everybody can tolerate them. They cause some cognitive slowing and sedation, and and so on. It's like they have some issues. And which neurons in particular do we think that they're concentrated in their action in? That is a great question. It's su subject of a lot of research. If we understood that deeply, then we could make a separate intervention targeted to those cells. The problem is that we don't yet know that exactly. We don't know exactly which cells are 
the most anxiety relevant cells that these these medications are are targeting. Um, there are some some hints, but I would say not factually known yet. So, but but you're getting to this key point where optogenetics was helpful because then we could ask that and answer that question. We could say, okay, which cells govern the different uh, features of anxiety, and then. Now, what am I talking about here with different features? Well, actually, this is kind of interesting when you think about it. So what is anxiety? Well, it's actually got different parts to it. First of all, there's physiology. We've all been anxious. We know heart beating faster, breathing faster. Okay, so there's physiology that changes. Then there's also a behavioral change. We, when we're anxious, we avoid the risky situation. We have an impulse to, to avoid if we're... <laughs> If we're anxious out in the open, we avoid going out in the open, and mice do this, do this too. And then finally, there's a negative quality to it, which this may is sound the, this trivial. is the negative valence. This is the hardest this part the to put valence. your finger on. This is the hardest part to put your finger on, and it's the most mysterious and perhaps the most difficult. But meaning the perhaps most the most difficult to experience. It's the most difficult to experience, and it's also the most difficult to understand why we have this. If, if we're already avoiding the risky situation, why does nature also have to make us feel bad? Mm -hmm. and, and this is, there are some very interesting evolutionary uh, uh, discussions one can have about that. The fact is, though, that's, that's how it is. Anxiety feels bad. And that's what makes it, uh, in many cases, so, so clinically uh, uh, causes so much suffering in addition to the behavioral dysfunction that happens. So actually, anxiety is complicated. It's got these different parts, and they all come on together, and all go away together, and then you've got to ask, okay, these, these are so different, they're probably controlled by different cells, right? So you've got behavior, and you've got breathing, and you've got inner subjective sense. These are all very different, probably different cells are doing it. So then right away, you've got to ask, what are we going to target? And so we, we thought we, we need to figure out this. And so we used, in 2013, we did a, an optogenetics experiment that targeted uh, different uh, parts of what we thought could be the anxiety pathway. And we found that indeed different cells control each of these different parts. There's a set of cells that control the breathing changes. And there's another set of cells right nearby that control the behavioral changes, avoiding risky situations. And there's yet a third set of cells that control the negative valence, the internal state. Each cleanly controls a separate feature of anxiety. And we did this with optogenetics, e introducing light sensitivity. And then reproducing each of these completely distinct manifestations of anxiety. Exactly, exactly. So you, we, could, we found we could turn up or down each feature in mice completely separately from the others. We could have animals that, and this, this got so interesting philosophically, we could make animals uh, avoid the open area the exposed realm that, that people and mice, but we don't, many people don't like being out in exposed areas. Mice definitely don't because that's when they, they're going to get eaten. Uh, we could make mice in, be much more uh, avoidant of an open space with a specific cell type optogenetic intervention, but the mice didn't care that this was happening. There was no negative valence to it. <laughs> and this was so interesting that, that you, we could create the behavioral avoidance of anxiety without the mice... Without the negative feeling. ...having this negativity. And so that, in, in, it turns out then that, that behavioral states that, that, that mammals have, they can be cleanly broken apart into these features, and we could show that with optogenetics. That was uh, one of my, you know, uh, one of the, the papers uh, from that period of time that was most interesting because it was, was so interesting in that regard. And other people, you know, Catherine Dulac, for example, at Harvard has done some great work on parenting, another quintessential mammalian state, using the same set of, of techniques, optogenetic techniques that we described. Uh, she did this in 2018. Mice are, are pretty good parents. They take care of their young, mostly. Um, they, that, that can break down at times, but, but, but they, they care for their young. And, and Catherine Dulac's lab did an amazing experiment. They optogenetically found that the different, different parts of parenting could be broken down mm -hmm. into their sub-features as well. And the two parts of parenting that were, were broken down in this way are going out to find 
the young and bring them back to the nest. So go go and get your, your kids and, and bring them back home. And anybody who has kids knows that's a big part of being a parent. You got to corral them, <laughs> get them back to the safe spot. But that part of parenting, that mice do very well. They also care for the young. They groom them. Uh, that's an extremely important part, uh, both human and mouse parenting, of course, is grooming uh, the, the offspring. Turns out there's a, there's a parenting controlling uh, area, but the go and get the kids cells are different from the groom the kids cells, and you can optogenetically break them apart very cleanly and show how this, this parenting state is assembled from its, its features. And this kind of thing has been, those are just two examples. But that, that kind of thing really gets to the, to the heart of, of what's so interesting about the, the brain is how do these complex states, how are they pieced together from cells? Why does anxiety track so closely in people with autism? Have you been able to glean any insights into that? Um, yeah. and, 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 you know, autism is, is something that interests me immensely. What, what do we really understand about this disease? Uh, I think we know that it's it's got a significant genetic component. It's not entirely clear what triggers it, um, but you know it's and its phenotype, of course, exists on a pretty extreme spectrum in terms of functionality, um, yeah. superpowers, and super deficits. Uh, but w- what do we know about autism, and and then specifically, why is it that anxiety tracks so closely in people with it? This autism is is one of my main clinical focus areas. This is actually my clinic office here. I see, I see patients with, with autism uh, spectrum disorders here. I know that they are hard to treat. There's not a medication that, that treats autism. But as you say, a lot of them are very anxious and, and that I can help with. I can help them uh, with, with their anxiety, with medications uh, like uh, the benzodiazepine class of medications that we talked about. Those help the anxiety they don't help the social problems per se, but they help with the anxiety. And and why is that? Why are these these patients with autism so? Uh, why did why is anxiety such a comorbid symptom as we say? Why does it show up so much in autism? Well, the the human social interaction world is very uh, complicated. It's very fraught with possibilities for misunderstanding catastrophic errors of interpretation, embarrassment, uh, humiliation, confusion. We have a, a very social world that we've created. And people who have difficulty with keeping up with the fast rate of, of social information and making sense of it, it's a very anxiety-provoking situation. How, when you're talking to somebody, how do you know where to look, what to do, how do you, what part of them do you pay attention to? Do you look at their eyes? Do you look at their mouth? Do you look at their body movements? God forbid there's more than one person. In a conversation with three people, how do you know who to look at? How do people know what to say next? To someone on the autism spectrum, these are extremely challenging situations because it's, it's very hard to to keep up with this uh, high information rate of, of the social interaction. And this is something in the book, uh, Projections, that uh, we, we've talked about. There's a whole chapter, a story on autism and on, on how this might happen uh, neurobiologically, how this information overload might happen. We have patients who are as confused by social interaction and, and as overwhelmed by it as you can imagine, uh, you know, somebody not knowing the language, not knowing the customs of, of a culture and being uh, placed into it uh, while extremely consequential things involving them were happening in, in real time. And that's kind of the situation. And so you can understand anxiety being a big part of, of, of autism, just being unable to predict what happens. And so these are, these are uh, patients who we can help with their anxiety, still not yet with their autism. The genes that are linked to autism there are many. It's a very genetically uh, determined disease, not completely, but heavily genetically. The problem is, like so many of the psychiatric disorders, the genetic underpinnings, it's a patchwork. 
That's many different genes that all contribute a little bit in most cases. And so with all the beautiful genetics, which has given us a lot of insight, it hasn't led to treatments because there's not a single gene, single protein, single cell to intervene in yet. Are you optimistic that that's going to change? I mean, what does what does the treatment for someone with autism look like in the coming decade? Let's let's keep it relatively short term. Well, the exciting thing is 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 optogenetics has given us a window now uh, into what could be this sort of ten year time scale of of, of autism uh, treatment because now. And again, mice are, are social. Not only do they parent, but they're also social. They will choose to spend time with another, even same-sex member of their species compared to being alone. Uh, and they have complex interactions. They have a give and take. They exchange information, and there's a lot of it. And if you make mutations in some of the genes that are most uh, powerfully related to autism that come from the human literature, you can make mice that have impaired social interaction as well. And we've done this and we've studied these in the laboratory and we've asked, can we correct the social deficit of these mice? And we can. And this is a whole thread of work in, in my laboratory studying social interaction and asking which cells, which circuits in the brain can improve social interaction, including in these autism mutation uh, mice. And what's pretty interesting is that, you know, if you think about social interaction, just like everything else, and, and the parenting example made that clear, there are different parts to it. Part of a social interaction might be the motivation, the drive to be social, and that could vary in people. Also, Cognition, the understanding, the, the insight, that could be separate. That's another part of, of being social, is understanding what the heck's going on. And probably different cells affect each of these, and indeed we found that. So some, there are some dopamine neurons that do seem to increase the drive for social interaction. But then there are other cells in the front of the brain, some, where some of the most advanced complex cognitions happen, the frontal cortex, that may be more involved in the information fire hose that's, that's coming through with a social interaction. How do you keep up with it? How do you make sense of it? That may be more of the cognitive side. And so just like everything else, you got to figure out which, what's most important. And we, we found those though. We now know the cells that can uh, improve social interaction in, in these different areas. And now that we understand these cells better, you can imagine designing medications that for the first time are aligned with a specific kind of cell that's known known to be important in social interaction. And that's the exciting opportunity for the future. Uh, we're not there yet, but at least now we have a causal cellular understanding and that opens so many doors. Is it your belief, Carl, that at least in the next decade or so, optogenetics will be the tool for establishing cellular uh, signal-wise causality, uh, but not be the mode of treatment. In other words, d you know, I'm sure people ask you this all the time. I, I certainly have a, a thought on this, but I, I, I thought it's worth asking just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Is it your belief that patients are going to be coming into your clinic with, you know, probes that you will be lighting directly to actually change the neurotransmitters via the light, or is it that we'll just use that as the tool to establish where to target our treatments? Or do you think yeah. it's going to be a combination of these? Optogenetics, in my view, is, is by far the most important aspect of it is it's a discovery and understanding tool. This helps us because this brings so much that we didn't have before. Understanding what actually matters, what makes things happen in the brain, at the level of cells is the opportunity that, that optogenetics creates. And, and that understanding then opens the door to every kind of treatment. Once you understand that, which cells are actually causing and relieving symptoms, you can design medications that address those cells. You can design brain stimulation treatments targeted to those cells or their 
axons as they uh, project across the brain. So it opens up every door uh, uh, in principle, uh, under, ha, providing this, this causal uh, foundation. Now, th now that said, and so that I see as by far the future. It's, it's the understanding that opens every treatment door. That said, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Botan Roska in Switzerland, just this year, was able to confer uh, a form of sight onto a blind person with optogenetics. And this was just published in the journal Nature Medicine uh, this year. 10 years ago, he and I uh, you know, had collaborated on a study where he put uh, one of our microbial opsins into a human retina, cadaveric, after life. So it was a, he, he had ways of keeping the retina alive uh, for some time in, in these donated uh, retinas. And he was able to show optogenetics work perfectly well to control human retinal neurons. And he spent the next 10 years doing all, going through all the, the hoops of, of, you know, going through primate studies and then clinical trials. And then just this year, he, he focused on retinal, he's a vision scientist and he focused on retinal degeneration and was able to take a human being who was blind from retinal degeneration and and he was able to create light sensitivity so this person could accurately reach for objects on a table that was not uh, possible before. So literally, you know, making a, a blind person uh, uh, see, at least to some extent, uh, uh, can happen. So I, I think there may be cases like that uh, and they're, of course, they're uplifting to, to see, uh, but the biggest picture is that it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a discovery uh, tool. I want to pivot a minute to talk about your your book because I think it becomes a great place for us to now talk about some of the the mental illnesses that people will be familiar with depression uh, mania and its sort of cousin bipolar disorder eating disorders all of these things that you've written about so eloquently um, first of all I want to tell you that if I'm not already in complete awe of your scientific achievements um, I'm equally in awe of your writing achievements. And I just don't think it's fair that one person can be so gifted on two dimensions, Carl. It's really disappointing. And I hope there's something in life that you're <laughs> horrible at so that I don't feel even worse about myself. No, seriously, your book is unbelievable. Um, it's called Projections and I've read it twice. Um, huh. And I will encourage every listener to read it because, um, well, it, it will shatter some of the images people have of scientists because you don't write like a scientist, right? So, and I say that as somebody who's in the process of sort of finishing up their book. And um, the biggest challenge I have in writing is making it accessible to everybody, making it interesting enough that someone for whom this is not their life wants to read it. Um, y you've done that in spades. This really reads like at times poetry. Um, I know you've always had an interest in writing, uh, did it require much effort and discipline to write about such technical matters at times, but also to write about, you know, sort of the clinical conditions, uh, the psychiatric conditions that everybody's familiar with. Um, you, you, it seemed effortless that you were able to do this in, in such an easily accessible and artistic way. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Pete. It's, it's, a it means so much to hear that I, I, uh, you never really know when you when you take a step like this or a risk like this if it's really working. And it, this was a this was a, a risk. This was something that uh, was very different. It's not what people expected, as you say. Not a typical uh, scientific uh, text at all, really. Uh, and and the goal I wanted, though, the goal I had was to help everybody. In the world, all whatever their background, I wanted to help them understand and feel what these these altered states are, and that's such a, a big part of the the book is to is to work with that feeling to help people understand and, and feel for themselves what mania might be like, or what the fragmentation of schizophrenia might be like, or the 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 crushing you know pathological uh, grief of of of, of bereavement. Or the, you know, the in incredibly uh, complex states of eating disorders, where you have these uh, astonishing uh, behavioral patterns that seem so 
uh, you know, inexplicable uh, uh, compared to what you would think would be what we were evolved uh, to do. And so everything from these uplifting, exuberant states of mania to the, to the depths, I wanted people to feel this. And so I had to do this with the writing, with the words. I wanted to do it with the writing and the words. And so in each chapter, you know, the, the writing is adapted to cause that, that, that feeling. In the, in the mania story, the, the words are exuberant uh, in the way that, that mania is in the, in the schizophrenia or psychosis story. Uh, there's a fragmentation uh, and, a, and a, a disorganization that happens. And so in all of these cases, I, I, I had to work with, with words in ways that are not typical for, for a scientist. And, but of course, I wanted to do it. This was my initial uh, passion in life. And for me, it was incredibly fulfilling, actually, to come back and be able to do this. I'd always wanted to do it. I had now not just the desire, but I had a mission. I had, I had something I wanted to, to tell, I wanted to share with everybody. And so for me, it was incredibly addictive, actually. I would, uh, I, I spent, you know, I, I did the bulk of the writing over a couple years from, you know, 2017 to 2019 or so, and, and then wrapped it up in 2020. And it was, uh, I looked forward to this so much every day. I would block out a couple hours, um, but a different time each day, depending on my schedule. You know, life's complex now. I've got, you know, five total kids. Things are hopping at home. Um, you know, uh, my wife, Michelle, is an incredibly accomplished uh, uh, MD, PhD herself. Also, also running one of our trials. classmates. Also one of our classmates. And, of course, she's in the hospital a lot. And so no day is, is simple or predictable. Uh, and so that the writing time would be at different times, often very late at night, often early in the morning. I tried to block out two hours, but I would find I would look forward to that like, like almost nothing else. And I would, I, I just relish the joy of finding the right word and spending days thinking about trying to find the right turn of phrase. And so it was, it was in, incredibly uh, uplifting, honestly, uh, even though, uh, of course, a big challenge logistically. One of the things I love about the book is how you really try to dive into the evolutionary basis for mental illness. This is something I'm always obsessed with. I always love trying to think about things through an evolutionary lens. And, and sometimes, you know, the answers come a little easier than others. Um, one of the places where it comes up is in the story of Alexander. This is a gentleman, uh, won't give away the entire story, but basically post 9-11 is triggered into what sounds like his first manic event, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Which then gets into kind of this discussion of mania. What is mania? Uh, one of the things I found very interesting about this was the discussion about the evolutionary basis for mania. Um, and, and this is interesting to me personally because you know, this is a very personal story, I guess. But when I was in residency, um, I was encouraged uh, by my wife actually to see a psychiatrist. She had some concern about um, some of my behaviors. And the psychiatrist, after one day, I, I don't know if she was right or wrong, um, but she decided I was hypomanic. That was her diagnosis. Um, and that, of course, got me very interested in, well, why is this the case? How does she know? what, why would this be? And, and I began sort of examining everything I'd ever done in life. And, and one of the things I came across was at the time it was a psychiatrist at Hopkins. So this would have been kind of 2004, 2005 had written a book suggesting that the prevalence of hypomania in North America was higher than anywhere else in the world because it had the highest concentration of recent immigrants. And the argument was, well, by definition, if you have a collection of people who are one to five generations away from people who had basically the nerve to leave a comfortable life elsewhere, and in the case of certainly my parents and many people who came here, basically to come to nothing. You don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you don't know the people. Um, it wouldn't be surprising that you could concentrate hypomania here. A, I'm curious as to whether you have any thoughts about that theory, but perhaps more importantly, let's dive into this evolutionary basis for mania 
Because the, the point that you get into about how there are some times when traits are very valuable at the population level and not at the individual level, I found that, I found that fascinating. Well, first of all, that's a very interesting uh, 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 route into this, this discussion, uh, which is the, the uh, immigrants, the, the recent immigrants, and the uh, possible you know, genetic uh, link to have the, you know, in recent times, to have the get up and go, to leave, uh, to take the risks, to have the energy, uh, to have the motivation, to, and, uh, to, to, to actually make it happen, to sustain it, this complex goal with, with so many uh, possible downsides. That's, that's no small thing. Some people wouldn't want to do it, some would. And mania is, it's one of the poles of bipolar disorder, uh, which is a very genetic, highly genetic uh, disorder. One of the most in, in psychiatry, bipolar type one disorder, uh, extraordinarily genetically determined. And, and what is it? Well, it's And sorry, just poles. to be clear, Carl, does that mean that bipolar stems from bipolar or it just clusters with other psychiatric illness? So in other words, uh, schizophrenia or uh, significant depression would also be genetic precursors to it. What it means in this case is that it's, uh, if you look at uh, monozygotic twins, uh, especially those that are, are raised apart, that's where the most uh, uh, you know, pure information comes from. You can look at the concordance of, of uh, mania or bipolar disorder appearing in each of these twins. And how high uh, is it? Identical twins. Uh, it's more than 50% uh, for bipolar type one, actually, in fact, verging above uh, 70%. Wow. And so you have a, a very strong uh, bipolar type one genetic And, and just out of so curiosity, all, what is it for autism in that same setting? Autism also high, um, just maybe just a touch under that. Okay. Um, with depression, it's like 50%. Uh, and so uh, most of the psychiatric disorders have uh, strong genetic links. They tend to be less than 80%. Um, uh, but but in this kind of 50 to 80 wow. percent range for many of the, the severe ones uh, from depression to schizophrenia uh, to autism to, to bipolar. And so this is something we, we face in in schizophrenia uh, and, and in autism uh, and in, but in bipolar it's 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 extremely strong. So right away we know there's that link and mania is the positive pole of, of, of bipolar disorder. The other pole is depression. People with bipolar uh, type one have had at least one manic episode where they have a period of time, could be a week, uh, where they've had this very clear, discrete state of elevated mood, increased goal-directed activity, projects, plans, spending, taking risks, faster speech, not needing sleep, truly not needing uh, sleep, not not nearly as much, um, uh, and you know, honestly, even though this causes problems and serious problems and, and not to sugarcoat it at all. Mania can do terrible things. People make very poor decisions. They it can be fatal. Are, yeah, I was just gonna say, aren't people even slightly more likely to harm themselves during a manic phase than the depressive phase? Yes, or the transition from out of depression to, to mania, that's actually probably the most risky time mm -hmm. when they they may still ha might still have some of the negativity from the depression, but now they've they have got the energy the to energy. Act. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that not not to say there's you know it, it's a it's a problem, but but yet at the same time you know some of my most memorable experiences in talking with manic patients is I actually love talking to them because there's such a, a charge of, of energy. Anything's possible. They're they're funny. They're warm. They're they're charismatic. Uh, and it's and it's so easy to see that this is a this is a state that's it's not a bunch of random things happening in the brain. This is a, a coherent state of elevated mood. It's consistent. You see it in one patient, you see it in another patient. It's something that's that's there that, that human beings have as something they can do, a sustained state of elevated mood and energy. And, and you look at that and you think, okay, you know, why? And, and also, uh, you know, what does that mean for treatment? Is there an ethical issue with, with treatment? Is there are there cases where mania is is positive? And and this is something that the story in the book in projections really made me think uh, so hard about. This was this was actually when the seed for the book was first planted in, in, in my head. It was just 20 years ago, um, right after 9-11, and this patient, Alexander, he had never had a a 
any psychiatric illness at all, nor in his family. And But he was flipped into a completely classic, full-blown mania after 9-11. He had no particular connection. He was, In fact, he was on a a, a sailing uh, trip in the Mediterranean with his with his wife at the time. Came back home after 9/11, um, and and a couple of weeks later uh, he was manic. All these symptoms that we talked about, and it was a huge problem. Um, he was, but his but the, he had this appropriate or at least uh, aligned quality to his symptoms. He 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 wanted to. He was he, you know he was retirement age. But he was training himself uh, to go into battle. He was rappelling down trees. He was running through the night. He was he was reading about military strategy, and and then it verged into this you know uh, very difficult, uh, emotionally challenging. He was screaming. He was hyper religious. He, he everything had become uh, uh, quite uh, extreme and incompatible with with his life. And so that ended up bringing, bringing him to the to the hospital. But you know, looking at this, and we think, okay, this is this is a state of elevated mood and energy. It was triggered by context, and this is actually the flip side of what you're saying with the with the immigrants. Not only is there likely to be a, a set of conditions that led to these people being able to take the, have the energy and willingness to take the the risk and, and meet all the incredible challenges of, of moving across countries and, and cultures. But then, you know that that's a that that's not that's not this fight or flight response of a minute when you've got a threat and you have to you have energy and then you meet the threat and then it's gone. We're talking about you need a sustained level of energy for weeks, months, years, even, and to, to take a to, to take a, a risk and a, and a, a life shift like that. And so, you know, this is everything is on a spectrum, and you've got mania, and then you've got this hypomanic state in between that it makes a lot of sense that that people who are able to sustain this elevated energy uh, state are are those that would uh, be be our immigrants. And it's a it's a and again, you have to look at this and think it's a spectrum. There definitely it can be bad, but we have to value. The whole spectrum and understand the whole spectrum. It's part of who we are as as the human family. Why do you think that in the bipolar condition you have this pairing of such opposites? Is the depression a necessary part of bipolar to basically allow the recharging after you know this unbelievable discharge of emotional and physical energy? Because uh, otherwise, I, it doesn't seem like these would. You know, like for example, why doesn't it just go normal affect mania, normal affect mania? That's a great question. Uh, we don't have the answer. Some people, uh, some fortunate people, are like that. There are you can get a diagnosis of bipolar disorder without ever having a depression. One one episode of mania uh, gets you that diagnosis uh, of bipolar type one, and those people, there are people who who haven't hit a major depression uh, yet. Um, that said. Uh, uh, most of the time, there is there is that other pole of of the disorder, and and what is it? Is it we don't know. Short answer is we don't know, but a lot of interesting ideas. One could be uh, sort of aligned with what you're saying that there's some resource that's that's exhausted. Uh, is it you know it's not a resource that we know what it is. Uh, we can't point to it. Is it a neural circuit? Uh, you know, state of some kind. Uh, uh, a capability of a neural circuit that can become exhausted. We know neurons can run out of uh, energy. This is part of how the brain stimulation to cause inhibition works, but that's all on a very fast time scale. Right. You can exhaust neurons on seconds to minutes. It's not known what really could get exhausted on the weeks uh, scale. We don't know what that would be. Or maybe it's a it's a it's the it's the termination mechanism, but it just overshoots. Mm. Uh, or Maybe it's just that what's lost is a the homeostatic thing that keeps energy in a in a tight range, and then it, it could go in either either direction because you've lost some some break that's that's present on either side. Not known, but a very interesting question. What is technically the most common uh, psychiatric disorder? Is it depression? Actually, the anxiety disorders, if you if you group them together, anxiety is the most common, and and that is um, 
but depression is 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 certainly up there. That's 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 uh, uh, in in the top group for sure. Uh, anxiety disorders are so underappreciated. A lot of people don't talk about them. Um, uh, a lot of people can make it through the day with anxiety, even if they're suffering uh, terribly. So yeah, anxiety is most common. What has optogenetics taught us about depression? So this, you know, this is my clinical specialty. I have, you know, right here in this office, I have, you know, we do, uh, I do vagus nerve stimulation, uh, for example. This is a, a VNS therapy, a radio frequency controller. Uh, we have, uh, we still do here electroconvulsive therapy. We do transcranial magnetic stimulation. Clinically, though, we're looking for guidance from the, the science because it's still not known clinically what actually is going wrong in depression. We don't actually know that uh, in a way that can guide therapies in the way that we'd like. And what's the, what's the scientific situation? Well, optogenetics has helped quite a bit because, and again, picking up on this theme, of course, there's different parts to depression, and this is how we diagnose it. We ask about all these different parts. There's depressed mood, and that's this negative state, okay? There's hopelessness, so it's kind of the opposite of mania. A mania manic person thinks anything's possible. Depressed person thinks nothing's possible. There's, there's a deep discounting of the value of effort, and this, come, this shows up as hopelessness. This even can lead to suicidality and certainly severe social and occupational dysfunctioning. And then... There are other parts to depression. There's something called anhedonia, which is really interesting. This is the absence of pleasure. Yeah, this is perhaps the most insidious component of depression by far. Right, right. And it's, it's, it's not commonly known. You don't, people on the street don't talk about uh, anhedonia, right? It's, they'll say they're depressed, but nobody talks about their, their anhedonia. But it's, it's an incredibly important symptom. It's a, a core, such a core symptom of depression that actually you can get a diagnosis of major depressive disorder without depressed mood if you also have anhedonia. It's that important. And it's the absence of pleasure or joy from things that normally bring pleasure or joy. And, and we've all had a cold and we've known that taste is gone, food has lost all, all joy. It's things, even without the cold, with the, with the anhedonia of depression, all the joy of food or social interaction or you know, your children, your grandchildren, uh, you know, a book, a movie, all the joy of life is, is, is gone. And this is a, it's a horrific thing. It, it leads, you know, to very serious problems. And that's, a, that's something that optogenetics has helped us understand. What, what do we know about that? Yeah, t wh where, where do the neurons reside and what are the neurotransmitters involved in the propagation of anhedonia? So, so again, you might say, how are you going to test this? And, and you, can, you can set up very simple behaviors with, with animals that, that provide some insight. Uh, first of all, uh, you could provide a simple choice for animals, mice like us like sugary drinks, and you could give the animal a choice of a sugary drink or just water. And normally, a mouse will prefer, kind of like we do, they'll prefer the sugary drink and, and by a factor of, you know, two to one or, or more. Uh, but a mouse that's been stressed, uh, it's had some unpredictable events happen, um, it's had its sleep disrupted, um, it will not prefer the sugar water nearly as much. Uh, it won't care as much. And so, such an interesting thing, given all the evolutionary importance of a small, high metabolic rate mammal needing sugar, and we know the reward that we feel from, from sugar and presume it's very similar for them, and then not caring. Sugar water, regular water. So in other words, if you had them going 50-50 between sugar water and regular water, that would be even more telling than if they disproportionately went to the regular water, right? You would be looking for a complete amelioration of the effect of the sugar water would suggest that they have basically lost interest. That's right. That's exactly right. And that in fact happens. And so, so we, we and others have explored this, this kind of thing with, with optogenetics. And we found that there are, uh, you know, pathways and coming back again to the, to the dopamine neurons, which are tightly linked to mood and mania and depression. These, but they're a complex set of cells. Some send connections to one part of the brain. Some send connections to another part of the brain. Uh, 
we have found some interesting uh, pathways that relate to those dopamine neurons where you can actually uh, affect how potent a normal rewarding stimulus is by something going on in the frontal cortex, in the frontal part of the brain. And overactivity in the prefrontal cortical areas can cause anhedonia in rodents. Mm. An overactivity seems to cause an, an inability of the dopamine neurons to recruit uh, reward uh, circuitry. And so this is an insight that optogenetics brought us, and it's something that we're following up mechanistically. It's kind of an interesting thing that there's, what we found is that, again, using optogenetics, that the frontal cortex can suppress both positive and negative things. It can suppress fear. It can suppress anxiety. This is part of how we exert cognitive control over situations. We can enter a scenario that we know is risky if we think about it enough, if we uh, frame it enough for ourselves cognitively, if we review the need for it, for taking this action. And so our, our frontal cortex can help us by tamping down uh, negative aspects, but it also, when overactive, it turns out can tamp down uh, positive uh, aspects as well. And optogenetics has given us an, a causal insight in, in, into this. And so that's just one example, but all the other features of depression as well are susceptible to uh, optogenetic study, and we've gotten insight into them. Hopelessness being another one. And so here, you know, again, you might ask, how do you, how do you measure hope in an animal? Well, you know, you can, you can put a, an animal in a challenging situation that is not escapable. The animal can, can try to get out of this uh, challenging situation. And would, then, would that be like a maze that doesn't have an exit? Yeah, no, no way of getting out exactly. So it does, doesn't have to be painful, just, just something that an animal would want to, to get out of. And, and eventually they, they give up. We can do this actually in fish as well as in, in mice. And that giving up is effectively, it's this hopelessness, it's this discounting of effort. And that can be a, an appropriate thing, let's say. Of course, if the situation truly is hopeless, it, it really is not good to keep devoting effort to it, right? If you if you keep flailing against an insuperable situation, you're burning energy, you could cause physical risk, you're distracting yourself from other things. Withdrawing, entering into a passive coping state is actually adaptive up to a point. The problem with depression is it becomes an extreme, so... It's maladaptive. Yeah. It becomes maladaptive. You discounted the value of everything, and then if it's got this mysterious negative valence to it too, which is of course also part of the problem. What do you think is the evolutionary basis for depression? This is something that is so ubiquitous. Um, I think I can, based on what you said earlier, see the evolutionary basis for anxiety. And maybe we could just argue that, that the pathologic version well, we could discuss why maybe it's been amplified and what it is about our environment that perhaps does that. But depression's a less less clear to me. And, and certainly mania is clear, right? I think we've made a very compelling case for why mania could be, why evolutionary pressure could have favored the propagation or at, the, at a minimum, the maintenance of this. Right. Why depression? It seems to be counter to your ability to mate, to find food, to defend yourself. I'm, I'm struggling to come up with one evolutionarily valuable a uh, tool that would be better in a depressed state? You know, and this is a great question. I think about this all the time. Um, and part of what we've discussed already may provide some insight, which is this, this withdrawal, this passivity. It is, in some cases, you can think of it like a hibernation. You know, it, if, is, it, is, it like, is it worthwhile for an animal to to actively try to cope with winter by running around trying to find more food all through the winter or to withdraw, to sleep more, to, to not see the value or feel the value in going outside and doing anything. And clearly, no matter what you do, you can't fight winter, right? The best thing is to conserve your energy, ride it out on some time scale that's appropriate. And so you think about 
now think about depression. Uh, it comes with this low energy. It comes with this hopelessness, this discounting of effort, this lack of motivation to go seek things to, to be enjoyed, reduced uh, uh, you know, drive for social interaction. Uh, all these things can be part of depression. The negative aspect is the one part that's, that's, that I can't explain, and that's, that's, of course, the clinically significant problem. Why does it feel bad? And this is not just feeling bad. This is agony. This is psychic pain. This is the kind of thing that drives people to seek suicide. Not to discount that at all. We don't understand why depression feels bad. But the passivity of coping, that can be adaptive. And it's it's perhaps you could you could see almost depression as a as a hack, a bad hack, maybe one that's not fully evolved yet, just like mania, not fully evolved yet, not under all the right controls to make it more generally suitable and reasonable. Depression, the easiest way to make it happen is to remove the joy, to remove the energy to seek out reward. And then you've got an organism that's going to be passive, that doesn't see a path to, 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 to something positive. And evolutionarily, if you, if you take this, this viewpoint, Maybe one way of, of getting to that goal uh, that had some, at the population level, some adaptive value included having this negativity, this negative state to it. And, and this is pure speculation, you know, but it's, it's important because depression is very genetically determined. It's, it's common, it's biological, and at some level, we have to deal with the fact that we have evolved to be where we are now and we have this high rate of, 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 of depression. And so we have to include in our thinking the biology and the evolution together. And so that would be my, my, you know, my, my take on it. Of course, it's very hard and I wouldn't claim to have a, a, a definitive understanding. Two unrelated questions. I don't even know which one to ask first, so I'll probably just ask them both and then let you take them whichever way you like. The first is um, sort of a desire to understand where depression specifically, but even other mental illness fits into our closest relatives, the primates, right? Do we have a sense that our primate relatives are as afflicted by depression and or other mental illnesses as much as we are? Um, mm -hmm. well, let, let's start with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can, yeah, one of the, the clearest things we can see is that, you know, non-human primates can certainly enter into maladaptive states that look like grief. Uh, in the bereaved states, there are cases where you, you can have a, a, a young non-human primate who is old enough to, to feed itself, but who has lost a, a mother, let's say has lost its, its mother. And... Uh, loses the motivation to feed uh, and protect itself and stay with the, the troop and ends up dying uh, as a result. Uh, this is a clearly maladaptive state documented um, that in a non-human primate, you could call it something like that, de a, a depressed-like state uh, deriving from bereavement and presumed uh, to anthropomorphize something like grief associated with, with bereavement. So I, I I believe these you know these states are are shared uh, by by our, our any our evidence of self harm in 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 um, non human primates does it ever get to the level of I mean you know suicide is a top ten cause of mortality in the developed world it's important to make sure people understand the significance of that statement. In the developed world, when you think about all of the problems we've been able to solve, one of the 10 leading causes of death is self-harm. And, and by the way, if you really include overdose as a subset of that, it probably leapfrogs into the top seven. Is there evidence that this occurs in other species? So a uh, really interesting question. And the, the short answer is uh, no, and uh, there are uh, less 
suicidal forms of self-harm that can happen. Uh, now and then you'll see animals, you know, carrying out behaviors like, you know, head banging and, and things like that. But in terms of a true suicide, the volitional ending of the self, there is not a animal model for that, let's say. It's not clear that that happens. And if you think about it, uh, as much as we'd like to have that so we could address this this urgent, enormous clinical need that's not going away, uh, we, we would love to have some way of studying this. Uh, we don't have it. And if you think about it, the ending of the self is an extremely cognitively complex thing. Uh, and, and it's if you think about the act of suicide, which we don't understand, and it's a it's a it's a horrific thing, but you've got there has to be some understanding of what that means, that there is an ending of life, an ending of the self, and that the pain that's being felt now would not be felt then. This is a level of understanding of the universe that it doesn't seem that animals that are not us uh, actually have. Uh, we could be wrong. I'm completely willing to admit that. There are amazing animals, you know, dolphins and whales and elephants have incredibly complex and amazing minds. They may be better than we are at some of these deep uh, concepts, but they may have less clear ways to express it. They may have maybe not having fingers and hands to do things that we can do. They may not have the ways to express it, even though their cognitions may be just as complex. And so I think there are two factors. One is, you know, we the things that set us apart, our brains and our hands, those two don't come together in any other animal. And I think that's why you don't see suicide elsewhere, at least as we understand it. Our colleague, Paul Conti, close also friend from medical school who trained yeah. with you in psychiatry has just written a wonderful book on trauma. Um, and so it begs the question, what role does trauma play in the amplification of depression? We know, as you said, that depression is highly heritable. Um, but like most conditions that are heritable, um, there tends to be environmental triggers that can bring one person to have it and one not to have it. Even if you take the most extreme example of the uh, monozygotic twins raised in a separate environment, one comes down with something, there's clearly some difference. Um, so what role do you think that, that early childhood trauma plays in all mental illness, but I guess specifically depression? And, and do you believe that that could be epigenetic? In other words, do you believe that this thing can irreversibly mark the gene and then be transferred to subsequent generations? Subsequent generations, yeah. This is uh, so the effects of trauma, the lasting effects of early life trauma, are unfortunately very clear. These you can you can see in animals as well, and they extend beyond depression, uh, for sure, to include the personality disorders like borderline personality, for example. Um, so there's no question that early life trauma has lasting psychiatric influence uh, throughout life and can cause very severe uh, problems. You know, many ways to, to look at this, you know, why is it happening and how is it happening? Uh, is there a, a wiring change? So is, is the lasting quality due to a, a physical structure of the brain as a circuit? That, that's one level at which it could happen. And the brain is very brain circuitry is very tunable that way, especially in young people. And so you could, you could imagine that early life experience with trauma sets up the human to expect in some ways that the world is a, is a harsh and unpredictable uh, place and that the value system had better be set up to deal with that because that's how it is apparently. And so you could almost imagine an adaptive, though very unfortunate uh, process going on where there's a, a period of, of youth where you're gathering statistics about the environment, deciding what the adult should be like, 
and then implementing that. And so early life trauma could in intersect with such a process very unfortunately and create people with a, a lasting state of, uh, of depression, for example, expecting aversive things to be present at, at higher rates and negative consequences of actions to be present at a high rate. Now, that could be for sure the case uh, as far as a, you know, an evolutionary logic, but there's no doubt that this happens in terms of the behavioral effect and the psychiatric effect, the lasting effects of early life trauma. Now, if it's not neural circuitry, what else could it be? It could be genetic or epigenetic, as you say. You're not changing your genome from childhood to adulthood, but you're changing the transcription factors, the promoters and enhancers. You could be affecting gene expression throughout life, and that, at least through the life of that individual, we understand how that mechanistically could work. And then finally, you raise the intergenerational uh, aspect. In human beings, this is very hard to separate from, you know, it's the nature and nurture thing. Of course, you've got the parenting that's linked to what might have happened in the prior generation. Um, and I'd say it's still controversial to uh, how much intergenerational uh, transfer can happen, although in animals there are mechanisms. You wrote about the well, at least you wrote about your your musings, your your exploration of the idea of the evolutionary basis for tears. I found this completely fascinating. Um, a, I found it fascinating because I'd never once considered that. And for someone like me who is often thinking about the evolutionary basis for this feature or that feature, it it was interesting to me that I hadn't considered that. But, but say a little bit about that. Emotional tears, and and by that you know, the, the, the liquid coming from our tear ducts at, in, in times of, of emotion, this is apparently, as far as we can tell, it's, it's a human trait. Our great apes don't do, the, do this, and even some human beings don't, don't do it. So it's a, it's a, it's a special thing. Uh, it's not that we are the only ones that grieve, but we're, we're the ones that sec secrete this, this fluid from our eyes at these extreme moments. And, uh, and this has been studied. There are scholars of, of tears, as it were, and, and, <laughs> and you can do things like add or subtract tears digitally from pictures of, of faces. And these have enormous impacts on the reactions of people seeing these images much, much greater than uh, a smile or a grimace, and particularly creating a desire to help. Uh, uh, when we see tears, we want to help uh, that person. And, and so this intersects very closely with the I think with the involuntary, largely involuntary nature of tears, it's a truth channel. It, it, it's not so easily gameable. It reveals something that in a social grouping, like those that, that we've evolved uh, to maintain, it, it's a, it's, it is an involuntary expression of something, the world changing, of needing uh, uh, new systems in place, and it triggers this outreach from people who see it in a, in a very powerful way. And, you know, this, this question, can a, an emotional change cause something like this to happen? It would be a very easy rewiring to happen. There are already axons that come from emotional regions and go to the brain stem that control the breathing rate, for example, in, in anxiety. And right next to those breathing rate regions, there are regions that control the tear ducts. They're right next to each other in the brainstem. And a very tiny, tiny rewiring, a little axon just going in one slightly different direction would create this state of expressing this visible uh, uh, manifestation of an inner world. Uh, and and with it, for a social uh, species like ours, it, it could be easily evolutionarily selected for. And so there's in, this, in the story, a storehouse of tears in projections. This is uh, something that that, that uh, a patient story helped bring to the forefront of my mind, and we talk and we talk about it quite a bit. Yeah, it's a, it's a. I won't give any more away from that story because I want people to read it for themselves. Well, Carl, I know that uh, we've kind of reached the limit of our time, and you have another commitment today. Um, as you can probably imagine, I could continue this discussion for probably another couple of hours. And I gather you could as well, if it weren't for this other Easily. commitment. So yes. right. um, I think what we should do is just commit to, to, to sitting down again next year at some point and, and, and continuing this discussion. There are so many more questions I have about personality disorders. And, and another topic that we didn't even get into today that we're both very interested in is psychedelics, 
yes. both from the traditional side, even to the non sort of traditional side, uh, you know, the use of ketamine, uh, psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, all of these things, which are an enormous interest of yours, uh, clinically and scientifically as of mine. So, um, yeah. I want to, again, Absolutely. congratulate you, uh, on, on not just your recent Lasker award, which uh, again, I'll make sure in the introduction to explain to people what the significance of that is, uh, but also your remarkable achievements over the past two decades and, uh, this remarkable work that you've, you've written projections, which I suspect many people are going to be reading after this. So Carl, thanks very much for, for spending time with us today and for educating us on this amazing journey you've been on. Pete, it's been great. Great to reconnect with you again and an incredibly enjoyable uh, conversation and uh, look forward to talking again. All right. Bye for now. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Drive. If you're interested in diving deeper into any topics we discuss, we've created a membership program that allows us to bring you more in-depth, exclusive content without relying on paid ads. It's our goal to ensure members get back much more than the price of the subscription. Now, to that end, membership benefits include a bunch of things. One, totally kick-ass comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, thing we discuss on each episode. The word on the street is nobody's show notes rival these. Monthly AMA episodes or Ask Me Anything episodes, hearing these episodes completely. Access to our private podcast feed that allows you to hear everything without having to listen to spiels like this. The Qualies, which are a super short podcast that we release every Tuesday through Friday, highlighting the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is a great way to catch up on previous episodes without having to go back and necessarily listen to everyone. Steep discounts on products that I believe in, but for which I'm not getting paid to endorse and a whole bunch of other benefits that we continue to trickle in as time goes on. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, you can head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.